This conference will now be recorded. All right, so we're going to cover Chapter 5, Medical Terminology. So obviously, um, with medical terminology, it uses foundational, anatomical, and medical terms and abbreviations in written and oral communication with colleagues and other healthcare professionals. Um, with that being said, um, some of the things we're going to utilize um, will be different anatomical locations of the body. Um, medical terms. Now, keep in mind, we were talking with uh, with patients. We may not use some of the medical jargon that we utilize, but in our documentation and in speaking with the nursing staff and physicians, we're going to be utilizing um, true medical terminology with them. Um, but I mean, like again, you're not going to call it an abdomen for a five-year-old, we're gonna call it the belly, right? So again, medical terminology is very important, but we also gotta know when we need to actually use those medical terms and then abbreviations. Um, and abbreviations can be also very dangerous as well uh, because you know people think chest pain, okay, CP for chest pain, but CP could also mean cerebral palsy. So again, um, keep in mind of what abbreviations you're gonna be utilizing and make sure that they meet the ICD-10 stuff and all the medical terminology codes. Uh, so EMTs need a working knowledge of medical terminology. Um, so we need to understand the key terms, acronyms, symbols, abbreviations. Uh, we use a lot of different things that are out there. These are gonna be really good for effective communication and documentation. We're also to determine the meaning of an unknown word by understanding how the terms are formed. So learning the definitions of parts of a term and understanding medical jargon leads to effective communication. Um, with that, it'll help us communicate effectively with other members of the EMS, healthcare, and public safety teams when we're trying to go through stuff. Again, we're gonna kind of break this stuff down. So anatomy of a medical term. So medical terms are made up of distinct parts that form or perform specific functions. Changing or deleting any part of any part can change the function or the meaning of a word. Let's get into this part here next. So components that comprise medical terms include the root word, the prefix, suffix, and combining vowels. Uh, so combining vowels are vowels that join one or more root words to other components of a term, so kind of together. So we look at the root word that we have, which is the foundation of the word versus the prefix, which then is what occurs before the root, uh, word root, and then the suffix, which occurs after the word root, and then combining the vowels together. So how the parts of a term are combined uh, determines its meaning. Uh, so looking at this, so accurate spelling is essential because one letter could change a complete word to something that's completely different. And this is huge when we start talking about medications. Um, so as you look at phagia, meaning speaking versus phagia, also meaning eating or swallowing. Did you see the difference between the two? Dis means the difficult or painful. So if you have dysphagia, it means difficulty speaking as you can see on the on the screen now. Um, this is gonna be very important to us if they're having a problem speaking because the dysphagia that you're seeing with that um, would be something we utilize for stroke assessment, right? Versus having trouble difficulty eating or swallowing. So as you can see, just a couple letter changes, as you can see, P-Y-S, uh, P-H-A, or P-H-S-I-A versus G-I-A, completely different versus speaking versus swallowing and difficulty eating. So as you as you can look at the uh, the words being when you're typing words out or if you're using like auto like dictation mode on your phone to type out a narrative or whatever you may be utilizing, you want to make sure you go back and check and make sure that those medical terms are accurate to what you're looking for in your run report. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how the parts of the term are combined determines its meaning. Also important um, to know that terms like ilium, 
or ilium, um, again, are pronounced exactly the same, but refer to different anatomical parts. You have the I-L-I-U-M versus I-L-E-U-M. So knowing the anatomy and the context of how these words are used can also help you correctly determine and spell the term in a given situation. So you gotta learn how the context of how these words are gonna be utilized when we're talking uh, to a patient or documenting appropriately when speaking with a physician. So the root words are the main part or stem of a word, which conveys the essential meaning, frequently indicating a body part. So let's get into that here in a second. If we add or change a prefix or suffix to change the meaning of the term, all right, looking at cardiopulmonary, it breaks it down into cardio being the root word of the heart and pulmon, which is the root word for lungs. A cardiopulmonary system would be like the heart and lungs together. All right, so during CPR, you introduce air into the lungs and you circulate the blood by compressing the heart. That's why they call it cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So we're pumping on the heart, pumping on the chest, we're inflating the lungs, providing oxygen, cardiopulmonary, right? Or you can use the term CPR. The prefixes, <coughs> sorry, prefixes appear at the beginning of a word, usually describe a location or intensity. Not all medical terms have a prefix, but also found in general language, like autopilot, submarine, or tricycle being three. Um, so you may see these uh, as well. So there's like antidepressants like tricyclics. Um, again, we'll get into that more when we get to cover behavioral emergencies and, um, and toxicological emergencies as well. Uh, but again, we'll try to break those down even more, but look at the prefix of the word. So one of the prefixes we're looking at here would be penia. So penia can add, one can add the prefix, A without, Brady for slow, tacky for rapid. So if I said tachypnea, that would be increased respirations, All right? If I said the word symptomatic, you would think they have symptoms if i say the word asymptomatic that means without symptoms okay so again these prefixes that we're using can create a completely different meaning of what you're looking for so if you have someone that's um febrile versus afebrile these are words you can utilize in your reports patient with afebrile with a temp of 98.6 or patient was febrile with a temp of 100 103.2 all right so febrile being fever, afebrile being no fever. Um, if you're using an aseptic technique, which means you're using a, a clean technique to provide a procedure, we don't want everyone to use a septic technique because that would just be us introducing a toxin to the body, right? Does that make sense? You guys good? Yeah, yes. Perfect, all right. So by learning the commonly used prefixes, you can figure out the meaning of unfamiliar terms. And you guys are gonna find these terms and they're gonna be like, what does that even mean? And all you have to do is just break it down, break down the word to figure out what part of the body it's coming from. So learn the common, commonly used ones. Um, usually appear at the end of the word, the suffixes usually indicate a procedure, like oscopy, like a colonoscopy. Um, condition, a disease, or part of a speech. Let's go into that here. So one of the ones is itis. And I, anything you see with itis means inflammation. So if you think appendicitis, um, pancreatitis, right? That means that there's a inflammation somewhere. Rhinitis being something with inflammation in the nose, runny nose, inflammation, okay? Endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis. Right. If I said endo, myo, pero, right, those are the three layers of the heart. And then if I say itis, then you have inflammation with that. All right. Um, pair with or artho would be a joint. Okay. And it creates arthritis, which would be artho, joint, inflammation, inflammation of the joints, arthritis. And if I said the word osteoarthritis, where would you think that would be? 
break it right down. What do you guys think? Um, the bones, right? Osteo being bones, artho being the joint, inflammation being inflammation, itis. So osteoarthritis. Now we're going to combine vowels, just connect root words to suffix or other root words. In most cases, it's an O, or it may also be an I or an E, which we'll cover here in a second. So a suffix begins with a uh, consonant and then um, and another root word. Let's go to the next slide here. Example would be gastro gastroenterology. Gastro being the GI system, right? Entero intestines, logy being the study of. So gastroenterology would be the study of the GI tract or stomach intestine study of, right? So gastroenterology or gastroenterologist would be somebody, a, a person who studies and knows as a profession the gastrointestinal system and has gastroenterology training for study of. Like a cardiologist would be a specialist in cardiology, which is the study of the cardiovascular system. So combining a, a form, so combining vowels shown as, as the word root, some of the common combining forms are cardio heart, gastro stomach, hepato, be liver, artho, joint, osteo, bone, and pulmono or pulmon, lungs. Right? So we use those common combining forms. Right? <clears throat> So if I said to you guys, if I said gastroenteritis, what would you think? Gastro, gas, stomach? Digestive swelling? Yeah, inflammation. Inflammation of the inflammation stomach. stomach. Exactly. Inflammation of the intestinal tract causing an inflammation or some kind of infection, which causes significant diarrhea. So someone that has diarrhea may come up with a diagnosis from a physician, gastroenteritis, right? Simply let it run its course. And they may get a, a form of antibiotics to reduce inflammation, right? So we look at that kind of stuff. If I said, um, I think of another one I can utilize. You can put on the spot and I forget stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll think of one here in a moment. I can't think of anything right now. This is what happens when I'm sick. <clears throat> All right, so word building rules. When building or taking apart a medical term, it's helpful to understand some of the basic rules. All right, the following summarizes, as we can see here, the rules that are covered thus far. The prefix is always at the beginning of a term. However, not all terms will have a prefix. The suffix is always at the end of a term, and we use a combining vowel when a suffix begins with a consonant to make a pronunciation easier. All right, so a term that has more than one root, a combining vowel must be placed between the two root words, even if the second root begins with a vowel. All right. So apply these simple rules. Sometimes you add an S from lung to lungs, right? So it makes it from one to two, two lungs or a lung. Words ending in, <clears throat> excuse me, A change to AE, like vertebra versus vertebrae, one versus multiple. Diagnosis versus diagnoses, changing IS to ES. Or EX or IX changes to ICs, like appendicitis or Apices or apex. So the apices of the lungs versus the apex of the lungs. Ganglion to ganglia. Ovum to ova. We're making those changes. Uh, US to I. So bronchus versus bronchi. So we're going to see these different changes looking at these different plural endings that we're going to see um, when we start talking more about our medical terminology and how we function throughout the lungs, how we function throughout the vascular system things like that. 
Uh, prefixes can also um, indicate numbers, colors, and positions, or directions as well. Um, that's what's very important versus um, pronation versus supination, inferior, posterior, you know, things like that. We're going to look at different word parts in different directions coming into this in a little bit. So with numbers, some prefixes indicate that a term involves a number or two or more parts or sides. Okay, as you can see in the examples here, multi, by, things like that. With colors, we're going to see like sino, leuco, erythro, like suro, melano, uh, looking at like cyanosis, leukocytes, erythrocytes, um, different colors like cirrhosis, you know, things like that, different root words and colors. Uh, positions and directions would be ab, ad, d, circum, peri, trans, epi, supra, like abduction versus adduction, um, inferior versus posterior. We have distal versus proximal. So you're going to see these different examples of positions and directions we're going to be utilizing uh, coming into different words. Um, so other directional terms we need to discuss would be where an injury is located and how the pain radiates in the body. So if you had a um, a tib, let's say a tibia injury, so lower leg, remember distal being away from the body and proximal being towards the core. If I said that the tibial injury where would that be located in comparison to the knee? Would that be distal or proximal to where the knee is? Proximal. So think of where the tibia being the lower leg, right? The knee being above it, and the injury is away from the body. Is it distal? Distal, right? If you had a femur fracture or a femur injury, is your femur located proximal or distal to the knee? Proximal. Proximal, closer to the body. Right, exactly. So if I said you're humorous, where is your humorous in regards to your elbow? Proximal. Proximal, right. So anything from a, from a certain landmark location away is distal. So the fracture that, that Sean was on a call with me the other day for on Monday, Tuesday, one of those two days of the week, all blends into one day, right? The patient had, looking at the the tibia and fibula of the of the lower leg, it was distal because it was the lower part of the leg. In comparison of the tibia as a whole or the fibula as a whole, it was a distal fracture because it was farther it was farther away from the body. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. All right. So some other directional terms is right and left. Very important to know your right from left. Um, superior and inferior the way to remember that is your bosses are always i hate using this term because i always think that leadership is is below employees because that's how you have to function in life as a leader you always want to be below your employees. Your employees are most important but in this term a boss is always on top right so think they're your superior they're higher than you it's going to remember it um, inferior being lower, superior being upper. Um, medial versus lateral. If you were to look at your, everybody take a look at your legs. I'm sure you guys, more of you are sitting down. Okay. If you look at your thigh and you look on the outside of your thigh, right? That's your lateral thigh versus medial being inside. So anything going interior would be medial. I think on the outside going lateral, away from the body, closer to the body based on your, um, your leg. So one of the biggest things you look at is your your lateral thigh, and that's going to be an important landmark for all of you as EMTs, because that's where you're going to be administering epinephrine pens and epi ready check and jet kits. It's going to be on your lateral thigh. You have to know the outside of the thigh. We talked about proximal and distal, and then you have superficial and deep, right? So superficial being on the top layer, deep being deeper inside, right? And we're going to talk about different layers of the skin later on. We get into the integumentary system, but superficial being on the top, deep being deeper inside. Some of the terms we're going to be utilizing. Um, 
ventral and dorsal, palmar and plantar, um, and then the apex, some other terms we're going to be utilizing. Remember that the terms right and left also refer to the patient's right and left, not yours. Okay, so if you're looking at the patient and you say it's the patient's right side, it's going to be on your left looking at the patient. It's opposite what you're doing. It's not your side, it's their side. Um, another thing you're going to have to know is like is what they call pronator, like pronation versus supination. Um, so if everybody takes their hands and their arms, six them straight out in front of you. If you have your palms down, it's called pronation, okay? That's going to be a key component when we start doing our stroke assessments, which is what they call pronator drift. So if you put both arms out in front of you and one arm falls down, that's drift, what they call pronator drift on a stroke scale. Supination, think of like holding a bowl of soup in your hand. You turn your hand over and palm up, that's what they call supination, right? Like planter versus palmer, right? Or, or a plant, um, plant reflection. So think of taking your foot and stepping on plants, pushing down, would be like a planter. So there's ways to remember certain different aspects of different positions um, when we start talking about this. So superior, inferior, remember superior is nearer to the head, inferior would be nearer to the feet. <clears throat> so your knee would be superior or inferior to your shoulder. Be inferior, right? Because I said in terms of that, near to the feet. Um, other terms describe the relationship of one structure to another. Like we talked about here, the example of the knee is superior to the foot and inferior to the pelvis. Lateral versus medial, outer versus inner. So body parts that lie farther from the midline. In general, lateral means to the side, the side of your body. Uh, parts of the body lie closer to the midline. Midline being taking a line, drawing it straight down the middle of your body. That's what they call the midline. And understanding different anatomical position of lines, we talked about that in a little bit. Those are going to be very important when you guys are doing 12 leads. And 12 leads is within the scope of practice for New Hampshire and now officially approved for Maine. All right. So on both sides now, EMTs can do 12 leads. And you're going to be looking at mid-axillary, mid-clavicular, all these different lines we're going to be talking about here in a little bit. Um, so example, a five centimeter laceration on the medial aspect of the thigh means toward the inside, like towards your towards your crotch, towards the middle. Okay, that's what we're looking at there. Five millimeter, five centimeter laceration on the medial aspect of the thigh. Proximal and distal. I think we've already hit this pretty good. Um, proximal is closer to the trunk. And distal is farther away from the trunk, nearer to the, the free end of any kind of extremity. So your hand is distal from your elbow. Your shoulder is proximal from your elbow, closer or farther away. Superficial and deep. Remember I mentioned before, superficial would be closer to the top of the skin or on top of the skin. Deep means away from the skin and farther into the tissue. So a superficial burn would be like a sunburn, right? A deep laceration would be the cut deeper into the tissue as like with a knife. So we have a deep laceration. Ventral and dorsal. Ventral refers to the belly side of the body, right? Anterior surface. Dorsal refers to the spinal side of the body and the posterior surface of the body, like a dorsal fin and a dolphin. We're going to remember that as well. Um, more commonly used terms are anterior, posterior, as well. So front side versus back side of the body. <clears throat> so we're going to do like an assessment, the back surface of the body. We're going to roll the patient onto the side and look at do a posterior um, assessment, like palpating the spine, checking the buttocks, you know, things like that. It's be more like a posterior assessment. So palmar and planter, planter surface, bottom of the foot. Remember I mentioned before, like stepping on plants. 
Uh, palmer would be the front region of the hand or the palm, otherwise known as, so the palmer would be here, but if you turn your hand up and aiming up towards the sea, like you're holding a bowl of soup, so they call supination versus pronation uh, being palms down. The apex or apices are the tips of a structure. Right, so the apex of the heart is the bottom um, inferior portion of the ventricles. So looking at the apex of the heart, which being the bottom inferior portion of the ventricles, is the left side of the chest. So we go to the left side of the chest, look at the bottom, take a listen here, the, the apex of the heart. Some other movement terms, flexion is bending of a joint. So if you're like flexing, think of your, like your, um, bending your arms, flexing your muscles. Um, extension is straightening of a joint. And then you look at even in further terms like hyperextension. So if I said hyperextension, what would that be? That's overextending. Overextending, right. And that's when we start tearing ligaments and tendons by overextending the joint. What if I said hyperflexion? The opposite. So when it's the opposite yeah. side, exactly. Over, it's an overflexion of the joint. Um, adduction is moving toward the midline. Abduction is moving away from the midline. So if everybody were to stand up right now, put your hands down by your side. Okay? That would be adduction, like you're adding to the body. Okay, abduction is moving away. So if you lift your arms up into the air, you're you have adduction. You're taking away from the midline, moving away from the motion. Adduction means you're adding to the body, going closer to the midline. <clears throat> so other directional terms um, would be bilateral, which means both sides of the midline, like eyes, ears, hands, feet, lungs. Unilateral would be only the one side of the body, like unilateral, unilateral chest expansion. That's very important because if we only have one side of the chest going up, we could potentially have a pneumothorax causing the collapsed lung, right? So we listen to lung sounds. We don't listen to just one side. We listen bilaterally, so both sides of there. Um, when you do an assessment, you check bilateral, like for knees, for example. We do a bilateral assessment because you want to see if one looks different than the other. Right. And then obviously listening to long sounds, chest rise and fall, equal rise and fall, and bilateral, clear bilateral long sounds. Um, the abdominal cavity is divided into four equal quadrants. And you guys need to know um, these very well. Right and left upper, right and left lower. And it's all based on your umbilical. Okay. That's where the line is. If you were to draw a line. Um, vertical and horizontal and break that down into four different quadrants, okay? You need to know where your large intestine, small intestine, kidneys are located, also those are retroperitoneal, um, your liver is located, your, your stomach is located, your appendix is located, your gallbladder, because when you're palpating and doing an assessment, you need to know where these organs are located and potentially having the problem as we do our palpation. All right, so directional terms, and when you put down in your narratives, in your own reports, if you have a right upper quadrant issue, you can write down um, RUQ, right upper quadrant. You can use that as an abbreviation. It's perfectly fine. So other directional terms um, to learn would be describing the location of an injury or assessment finding. So again, it's important to learn all of these terms and concepts. So you can describe the location of an injury or an assessment finding in your narrative, so you can also talk about it with your physicians that you're coming up in contact with when you're giving a patient report to a doc or another or a nurse. So you want to use these terms properly so that any other medical personnel who cares for the patient will know immediately where to look and what to expect. Now, if you're now keep in mind, you're going to be all brand new EMTs. So you're going to come in contact with doctors and you might be a little nervous giving your first, second, third, 20th report. It's okay. All right. So if you forget the word distal, you can say it's located below the knee. Okay, that will work for now, but you wanna get used to those medical terms. And the physician, if they're talking with you, they're gonna start speaking in medical jargon, right? 
So understand that. If there's something that you don't understand, there's no harm in saying, hey, doc, can you explain that to me? Because most of the time, 99% of the time, the physicians love to teach. And they're going to be there to help you out and make you a better provider. All right. Uh, anatomic positions, prone and supine. Um, supine being lying on your back, looking face up. Um, prone being lying on your stomach. All right. The Fowler position is a semi-reclining with head elevated position. All right. So you have what they call a semi-fowler and fowler, two different positions, one's up a little bit higher than the other. So we start talking about stroke patients, we want to put them in that semi-reclined head position at a 30 degree angle. That way they were not putting a lot of pressure on the head if they happen to have a hemorrhagic stroke or hemorrhagic bleed. All right. So well, again, when we get into the neuro assessments and neuro neurology lecture, we'll talk more about positioning and strokes. But this is just trying to give you like kind of a a warm up to be ready for these types of terms being utilized because it's going to help you make that assessment, your assessment, that much better, and also including treatment as well. Um, also, to add to the Fowler position um, as well, to add to this is that it's also a semi reclining position, but with the head elevated to help the patient breathe easier and to control the airway. A patient who is sitting upright is said to be in a Fowler position, right? So it's not about semi-reclining. We have the semi-fowler, which is like your 30 degree, 40 degree angle versus a fowler position where you sit at the back of the stretcher and you sit it all the way up, right? So if we have a respiratory patient, we want to put them in a fowler position because the last thing anybody that has respiratory issues wants to do is lie down, right? So we're going to sit them up. As you see here, semi-fowler being right around 45, in the high Fowler position or Fowler position being at a 90 degree angle. So we talked about earlier about how to breaking terms apart. So using the meaning of words to decipher the term. So we want to define this in this type of order, the suffix, prefix, and the word root. All right, we're going to utilize those there. And here are some examples we're going to talk about. Uh, <clears throat> If you look at um, nephropathy, we look at breaking it down, pathy being a disease, O being a combining form, and neph meaning kidneys. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, neuropathy or nephropathy is a disease of the kidney itself, okay? So when you break down even more, we look at nephron meaning kidney. In the kidney, there's something called nephrons, which we'll get into more when we start talking about um, the renal system. But again, that's the breaking down of nephropathy being a disease of the kidney. Um, if I said neuropathy, what do you guys think that would be? Breaking that down, neuropathy. Any thoughts? Right. So disease of the nervous system. And you're going to see neuropathy in which type of patient? What do you guys know about neuropathy? I know this is all brand new. Exactly. Di uh, diabetics being one of them. <clears throat> so many, yep. Deb mentioned many people have it in their feet. Exactly. And we see this a lot with diabetics and also more towards the elderly that start getting neuropathy. Neuropathy is very important to understand because a patient having a heart attack because they have neuropathy, especially a diabetic, may not have these the typical chest pain signs. Um, and all they may have is what they have an upper upper gastric pain and they could be having the big one. Um, you're right, though. They may not just be related to diabetes. Diabetes is one of the causes of neuropathy also um, in a roundabout way. So we look at um, just having the lack of feeling. We'll get more into this in detail. We start talking about neuro. I don't want to spend another hour talking about neuro neurological emergencies today. Uh, we'll get into that more. Ooh, wrong button. So dysuria, what do you think this would mean here? 
painful urination. Yes, Deb, thank you. Yep. So if you guys saw the chat box, um, we also present the cancer patients from in, or, uh, anxiety or spinal issues as well. Absolutely. So dysuria, okay, E, I mean condition of, dys meaning difficult, painful, or abnormal, and you are meaning urine. So dysuria would be a painful urination. Uh, so we want to ask the patient, that's a very important question, if they have painful urination or if you have any foul odor as well, because that could also lead to urinary tract infections, which can then lead into urosepsis, depending on uh, patient's vital signs. So as you can see, all these things will start meaning something that eventually um, will all come to terms in together and saying, oh, this is actually what's wrong with my patient. So they have dysuria, they have a small um, painful urination, they have a foul odor, uh, and they self cap at home. Okay, it was probably a UTI at this point. So you can look at things like that, breaking things apart. Um, hyperemesis. Hyper being excessive, emesis being a root word, vomiting. So hyperemesis would be excessive vomiting. <clears throat> Analgesic, right? IC being pertaining to and being without or absence of Angel is being the root word for pain. So analgesic would be pertaining to no pain at all. So analgesics that we, that we carry at the medical level would be like dilaudid, morphine, fentanyl, ketamine, toradol, at the EMT level for New Hampshire, uh, PO Tylenol, so PO being oral, um, Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, at the A level in, in Maine, or at the paramedic level, we have IV, IV Tylenol. Those are all analgesics that help reduce pain or <clears throat> reduce pain to a patient, right? So analgesic. Uh, shorthand used for co uh, communication. So a lot of things we utilize for this. Um, with that being said, do not trade speed for accuracy. Okay. Again, sometimes certain abbreviations mean something <clears throat> or something completely different, and you think that's what's, what's going to work. Um, some agencies limit the use of abbreviations. Abbreviations we don't use them a lot. Um, I use them the, the more common ones. But again, if we don't know what that means, it's going to be hard to justify that in any kind of report. So remember that medical abbreviations, acronyms, and symbols are a type of shorthand used for communication developed because one could communicate faster using this method. Um, use only commonly understood acronyms, abbreviations to minimize misinterpretation and errors. Like I mentioned before, CP is cerebral palsy, C slash P is chest pain. Completely different treatments. Uh, the Joint Commission and, uh, and the Institute for Safe Medication Practices are considered two authorities on abbreviations and provide do not use lists. I do not have that list. When you use an abbreviation, you um, pronounce each letter of the abbreviation separately and distinctly so we know what they are. Um, so take the place of a word actually to shorten and for documentation. To be familiar with the abbreviations in your service area when you use them. And try also try not to um, use unaccepted. So only use accepted abbreviations to avoid confusion or errors. Like I mentioned, the cerebral palsy versus chest pain, completely different. Uh, so you want to have down or document the wrong assessment. Um, symbols often sometimes use as shorthand and only accepted symbols to avoid confusion or errors. The biggest ones that would be documenting like male versus female, um, things like that. But when you're typing out narratives, those symbols are not available to you. So you actually have to spell out male and female. All right, so let's go over a little bit of review and we'll take a break and come back and finish up the next lecture and we'll be done. Uh, which of the following components of a medical term conveys its essential meaning? All right, the answer is C, you already got C, perfect.
Number two, prefixes can indicate Right, they got A. We're going to put down B. Our prefixes are used to indicate colors, numbers, positions, or direction. Suffixes will indicate procedure, condition, disease, or part of a speech. Uh, root words will indicate specific body parts. The plural form of a word, bronchus, is... I saw that there was a question on there, but then everybody started typing in letters. Hold on. I'm going to scroll back. So, Nick, you put down how about tacky, and which one were you? Oh, this. There you go. <clears throat> All right, tachycardia. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> We'll get back to that here. Let's see. So the answer is D, and we got that one. Right. Number four. So the statement, the lungs are superior to the bladder, indicates that the lungs are closer to the. Yep, C it is. Number five, movement of the arm toward the midline refers to as. Remember that I mentioned toward the midline means you're adding to the body. Away from the midline is abduction. 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 Right. So adduction, adding, the answer would be C, moving toward the midline. Number six, a body part that lies closer to the midline when compared to another is considered. Would that be right. proximal? We got A, medial. So, oh, there you are there. So remember that away from the body. So think of your thighs. So, so closer to the midline. So the midline drawing a line straight down your body from the head down through your crotch to the floor. All right. Closer to the midline is medial. Away from the midline is lateral, medial lateral. All right. This is used to identify a body part that is on the belly side or anterior surface of the body. All right, D, ventral. Number eight, you place a patient in the semi fowler's position for transport. This means the patient is perfect. C. A laceration located on the plantar surface is on the blossom. Awesome. Yeah, got it, A. And number 10, when using abbreviations, acronyms, or symbols, an EMT should. I'm going to say D. <laughs> All right, D it is. All right. Let me minimize this. This conference will now be recorded. All right, so we're going to cover chapter six, uh, the human body. 
So again, this is going to be an overview of the human body, uh, which means I'm not going to go super in depth on different systems. We're going to cover that in in upcoming chapters. Um, like for like I mentioned before, if we talk about respiratory emergencies, we're going to hit hard on the respiratory system. So again, it's kind of like an overview: phones, systems, how things work, um, and then, like I said, more in depth as we move forward. So applies fundamental knowledge to the emergency medical services system, safety well-being of the emergency medical technician, and medical legal ethical issues to provision of emergency care. We're going to cover A and P, anatomy and physiology. Applying applies fundamental knowledge of the anatomy and function of all human systems to the practice of EMS. And we deal with the entire body system as we go through this. The pathophysiology applies fundamental knowledge of the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion to patient assessment and management. So if we have <clears throat> respirations and how we're going to perfuse the body to get oxygen to the cells and then and therefore have gas exchange and how it functions throughout the body. And how we're going to be able to manage that on the patient that is in that to meet homeostasis. We have a patient that is in normal conditions, and if they are deviated, how are we going to treat it and make it better for the patient? So having a working knowledge of anatomy is important. This is the, the base of what we do. Uh, some, again, want some of the more boring lectures, but also some of the more important lectures are A and P based um, and how the body works and, and what we have inside of our body and, and how do we be able to treat something if something goes wrong. So knowledge of, of anatomy helps communicate, or sorry, you know, communicate correct information to other medical professionals and to others who may not understand medical terms. So our job is to kind of explain to them what is going on. One of the biggest things in communication is talking with your patient. Um, so if we're talking with our patient, we need to let them know what we're doing, why it's happening, and what's gonna happen in the body. For example, if I give somebody albuterol, all right, I need to let them know that this is a sympathomimetic medication, right? So you guys wouldn't know that yet. Some of you may know it, some of you may not, but you're going to learn it as we move through. I'm going to give them a sympathomimetic medication. What I'm going to do is allow for bronchodilation. In turn, you're also going to see your heart rate increase. Your heart rate is increasing because it is a beta-1, beta-2 agonist that increases the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that increases your heart rate. It's a, it mimics the sympathetic nervous system, right? Um, by doing that, um, we're triggering our neurotransmitters in the body, which would be like norepinephrine, to increase rates, okay? So we're gonna have that beta one effect, which would be heart rate, because you have one heart, beta one, and it's also gonna have bronchodilation, beta two, two lungs, right? So having an understanding of what medication is done using anatomy and physiology and how it works in the system will not only make you a better provider. Again, I threw a lot of information at you right there. Don't be scared of it. You're going to learn it as we go through the program. Because remember, you're still brand new. We're going to get there, right? But having that A&P and then pharmacology and everything all ties in together into a patient assessment knowing what to expect if you do something and how to explain to a patient what they're going to feel like if you give them this medication, not knowing A and P is not going to help you at all. Uh, this is why it's so important to know uh, and to kind of help. So topographic anatomy, superficial landmarks, sort of the guide to structures that lie beneath. Topographic anatomy applies to a body in the anatomic position. Uh, so the true anatomic position, you're going to see this on an exam. You're going to see this anatomic position as well um, in National Registry questioning. It's going to be the patient stands facing you, arms at the side, and palms aiming forward. That is the true anatomic position. So topographic anatomy applies to the body in an anatomic position that so that everyone is referring to the body in the same way. 
So anatomical position allows you patient stands facing you, arms to the side, palms forward. Directional terms are always from the patient's perspective, like the left arm, right? So we look at the patient's perspective, not ours. Now there are different planes of the body. So imaginary straight lines that divide the body into different areas. There are three main areas we're gonna focus on. What they call the coronal plane or the frontal plane divides the body from front to back, okay? The transverse or axial plane divides the body from top to bottom. And the sagittal plane or lateral plane divides the body from left to right, all right? Now, with that, they have a mid-sagittal plane as well, which is a special type of sagittal plane where the body is cut in half, leaving equal left and right halves. All right, so the next picture I'm going to show you guys is what we're looking at here. So as you can see, the frontal going straight up and down. Um, sorry, side to side. Transverse being cut in half of the body versus your sagittal sagittal or lateral plane as you can see going front to back posterior to anterior <clears throat> that makes sense good i'm seeing goods on the text boxes yes something awesome um, these are very important uh, especially if you start getting into radiology stuff like x-rays and reading x-rays they take different pictures, different planes, and looking at the body. Um, so, if you're talking with a physician, you're doing interfacility transport. They may tell you that you know we did a, a, a transverse plane view. A lot of times, you'll see this in your um, in your CAT scans, your CTs and CT angios. Um, you'll see like different views of the body, looking at the different organs, looking for inflammation, bleeds, and things like that. Uh, the skeletal system, this is what we're going to be dealing with a lot. We talked about the musculoskeletal system anatomy. The skeleton gives us our recognizable human form. It protects vital organs and it contains bones, ligaments, ten tendons, and cartilage. The skeletal system um, protecting our, ourselves and gives us our form. Elements of the skeleton, there are 206 bones in the body. This constitutes the structure of the skeletal system, okay? Do you have to know all 206 bones in the body? Not as an EMT. As a paramedic, you, you learn them all. You learn every one of them. I can tell you after 11 years of being out of school, I have probably forgotten a lot of them. Uh, but again, you have to memorize them, you have to learn them, and the bones are very important. You're going to see this over and over and over and over again. Um, ligaments, uh, sorry, before you use ligaments, the skeletal system, the bones provide a framework for the attachment of muscles. All right. So we start talking about ligaments. Ligaments are fibrous tissues that connect bone to bone, bone to each other. So if you have a ligament tear, Right, ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons are rope-like structures that connect muscle to bone. And then cartilage is a smooth connective tissue that covers the ends of bones at mobile joints. Right, so you have cartilage, cartilage in your like your knees, your elbows. Um, you have cartilage in your throat. You have cartilage in your chest. Um, a lot of different areas you have know, again we're going to go over the more of this in detail as we move forward the axial skeleton um which is the foundation in which the arms and legs are attached include the skull the spinal column and the thorax right so we have the axial skeleton okay you might see this on an exam or a quiz includes the skull the spinal column and the thorax Right, so let's talk about the skull. In the skull, the cranium is made up of four bones. The face is made up of 14 bones. So let's talk about the cranium. Truly, in the head itself, 
there's actually 64 different bones in the head. Um, I need you guys to remember the 18 bones that are there. All right, so in the cranium, which is the top of the head up here, that protects the brain, which also connects the spinal cord through a large opening at the base, which is where you're gonna see. Can you guys see my mouse on the screen at all? Probably right here. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Let me um, not hit that button. That'd be horrible. Let me go to my laser pointer. All right. This big opening, okay, it's called the foramen magnum. All right. So the foramen magnum is where the spinal cord connects to the base of the skull. All right. So when your spinal cord connects, we have our different vertebrae, sort of cervical vertebrae, right? In that, you have your C1 and C2, which is called your atlas and your axis, okay? Your major system runs through there. Any kind of deviation, sever, severance, or anything like that at all will cause immediate death, right? So the remember, remember, way to remember this would be is like C3, 4, and 5, they keep the body alive. Without that, your body can't function. We're going to get more into that later when we start talking about the, the nerves and everything else. Um, <clears throat> this is made up of four bones. We have the posterior of the cranium, which is called the occiput. So if you look at the back part of the head, which uh, is in the side over here, that's called the occipital bone. Behind that, you have the occipital lobe of the brain. The occipital lobe is your major vision center, all right? So if you have someone who falls and cracks the back of their head, you should be asking the patient, do you have any blurry vision? One of the biggest things you want to ask about because that is where your vision center is located, All right? The next part is called the lateral portions. So each side of the cranium are called the temples and, and or the temporal bones. So if you look here, temporal bone here, and you're going to have a temporal bone over this side as well. All right. Then you have your forehead, which is located obviously here. And in that is your frontal lobe and or your frontal bone. So four bones of the head. You have the frontal. You have the occipital, the parietal, and temporal bones. Got it? Cool. All right. Awesome. Then you have facial bones, and there's 14 facial bones that I need you guys to memorize. And the best way to do this, by the way, is utilizing flashcards. Um, another good one as well is, is a coloring book. It's called the Anatomy and Physiology Coloring or Anatomy and Coloring Book. Um, I use that through medic school. Let me tell you, it helped me because you got to color pictures and you get to remember the bones. Kind of neat. Good stuff. All right. So we have 14 bones. Number one would be the upper non-movable bones, right? Which is your jawbone. Right? So you have your mandible down here and your maxillae up here. So this is a non-movable bone, your maxilla, located just underneath the nose, above the top row of teeth. Right? The next one down is your mandible. That is going to be your jaw. Okay, your jawbone. That is a movable joint. Okay, which hinges up into here. It's like a more like a hinge joint up located up here. Um, good to know because you can get locked jaw, especially patients that have tetanus. Um, you can get locked jaw. So obviously it happens through the, the zygomatic joints. So we have our mandible and our maxilla. The cheekbones are called zygomatic bones. All right. Then we have the nasal bones located just above the cartilage. So the lower part of the nose is all based on cartilage. Above that, you have your nasal bone where you can actually have fractures. Um, to the side, you have your eye sockets, as you can see here. This is called an orbit, looking around. This is one of the most common fractures you're going to see in facial fractures because the orbit is a very thin bone that goes around. Uh, what you'll see with this is something called raccoon eyes. So if you have a person, a patient that has um, significant bruising around the eye, most likely they have an orbital fracture. Uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me. So these are the bones I want you guys to memorize. So then you have the zygomatic, the maxilla, the mandible, obviously the bones of the head as well, and then the very short bones that form the bridge. So these are going to be your 14. Now keep in mind that the zygomatic bone, you have two of them. You have one on each side. So that counts as 14 bones, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, you know, and keep working your way up. Now, also, just so you guys know as well, you have access to these slides, okay, including the um, instructor presentation stuff as well. So you can download the PowerPoint presentations and review these as well uh, for more information. The spinal column has 33 vertebrae, and you're going to see this in your exams. You have seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccyx or coccygeal vertebrae, right? Broken down in sections. So your cervical, it would be called, and they're labeled uh, C1 through C7. The only difference is that C1 is called an atlas and C2 is called an axis. Um, so with C1, thinking of the atlas, like a globe that sits on an axis that spins, that's the way to remember, C1 versus C2. And as you can see, um, all the nerve endings, as you can see, coming off the vertebrae, right? We'll cover about those later on. Um, that's important because if we have a severance of a spinal cord, from that point down becomes paralyzed so that you no longer have your nerve endings and coming off and actually functioning the body. All right, so we'll get into that, like I said, that later on down the road. All right, so we have C1 through C7, then we have T1 through T12. These are your different vertebrae, and within the vertebrae, you'll see the spinal processes. These are the bumps that you feel on the top. So as we're palpating the spine and doing an assessment, we want to palpate each spinal process to see if there's anything called a step off or if it's moved off place. If we feel a step off, there potentially could be a fracture at that point. Um, there are five lumbar vertebrae. Then we get into our sacrum or our sacral. There are five vertebrae, but these are fused together as one bone. And we have our coccyx, which other name would be a tailbone, which are very commonly fractured by patients that fall onto their bottom from a, from a, from a height. They can actually fracture their tailbone, and that's going to be your coccyx. So remember, there's 33 vertebrae. And if you look just above that, you'll notice you'll see the brain stem, right? The cerebellum and the cerebrum, all right? We'll talk about those here in a little bit. Let's keep those in mind. All right, so more of the axial skeleton is the thorax which are formed by 12 thoracic vertebrae and 12 pairs of ribs. The thoracic cavity contains the heart, lungs, esophagus, and the great vessels of the body, right? Like your aorta, superior and inferior vena cava, all those different great vessels that keep the body alive and pumping. And to kind of give you a perspective of the size of your aorta, which which is your major blood supply, is about the same diameter as a quarter. So imagine that rupturing inside your body. You can bleed out within 90 seconds. All right, it's so important that we have a protective cage. Um, so midline of the chest is called the sternum. This is your sternal bone here. Very, very strong bone within the body, All right? At the very top is the sternal notch. At the very bottom, there's a little piton that hangs off the thing. This is called the xiphoid process, right? This is very easily broken off, okay? So just be careful with that as you're doing your assessments, right? It's called the xiphoid process, right? If you look at the ribs, they start at the clavicle, which is up here, right? We start counting down, rib, one, two, three, and four. In between each rib, those are called intercostal spaces. So if you guys are probably asking, well, why do we need to know that? Intercostal spaces are going to be your key landmarks when doing a 12 lead EKG. 
okay, especially the fourth intercostal space and the fifth intercostal space, because those are going to be utilized for 12 leads. So understand your landmarks and palpate the chest to find the ribs, right? We want to make sure we're checking what you call rise and fall to make sure we don't have something called flail, which we'll get into more in musculoskeletal emergencies um, when we have two or more broken ribs in the same order. Uh, there are three components with this. Um, there's a mambrium, which is the upper section, as you can see here, the sternum, right? Then we have the body, which is the middle of the sternum. And the lower part of the sternum is the xiphoid process. All right, any questions on the axial skeleton? All right, so the appendicular skeleton, which would be your arms, legs, and their connective points and pelvis. This includes joints, upper extremities, the pelvis, and the lower extremities, which we'll cover here in more detail. So joints occur whenever, whenever, where, eh, wherever bones come in contact, right? Like your thumbs, your knees, your your fingers your shoulders, your pelvis, right? Looking at the top of the, the femur going into the pelvis, right? There's all different joints. There's what they want. So there's two types. There's actually more than two. And I will go a little more in detail on some of the other ones that are actually there. Um, two types of joints we're going to cover, though, mainly is the ball and socket joint, which allows rotation and bending. With that being said, where do you think that you would find a ball and socket joint? Since everybody did all their reading today. Yep. Next. Yeah, the hips. What else? Your shoulder. Yeah, knee. Shoulder. Well, is a knee a ball and socket or is it a hinge? Knees and hinge. Hinge. Yeah. Yeah. So the knee would be the hinge, and so wouldn't your elbow. Okay. But now we have other joints within our body too. Okay. So in our fingers, your knuckles that you have. Okay. And we're going to break down the hands even more, talking about the phalanges itself later on. But the knuckles are called synovial joints. And inside those joints is something called synovial fluid, which help the joints keep lubricated. Okay. When you pop your knuckles, really all you're popping is air pockets. Okay. Um, in your thumb, so your thumb that connects to your hand, that joint is called a saddle joint. And that's the only place in the body is on your thumbs that you have a saddle joint located. Okay. We have synovial joints in our feet. We have synovial joints in our hands, but saddle joints are only located in your thumbs. And think of it as saddle. Do you know how if you look at your thumb holding your hand like you're shaking someone's hand, it kind of sits on the hand like a saddle. It's a saddle joint that's there. <clears throat> All right. As you can see here, thinking of a hinge versus a ball and socket, right? That's why it's so easy to see dislocated, you know, hips, or and then also dislocation of the um, the shoulder into the arm, dislocated shoulders here, because this ball and socket can pop out. So the upper extremities are comprised of. Um, The arms, the forearms, hands, and fingers. Okay, so we look at the upper extremity, which extends from the shoulder girdle, where your shoulder sits, to the fingertips down. Let's get into this here. So your clavicle, one of the very, very common sport-related injuries you're going to see, is going to be your uh, the clavicular fracture. All right, so if everybody can palpate their clavicle. All right, there's no support underneath it. That's why we see these. Um, fractured very easily, and they're under a lot of tension. So any kind of um, pressure on these can actually cause a clavicle to snap. These are connected by joints. One's called a sternoclavicular joint, and the other one's called an acromioclavicular joint, or they call the AC joint. 
okay, on either side. AC joint, um, and then you have your sternoclavicular joint on this side here. This connects into the scapula, which is on the back side, which can be can be fractured. Um, I've seen a lot of these on motorcycle accidents back here, which has been nothing but a floppy mess and mush. Um, which then goes into your shoulder joint, which your the ball or the acromion sits inside of the socket. So the ball sits in the socket and allows for movement. And remember, it's attached by, by ligaments holding all this together, right? Everything's all attached together with ligaments. That's why you can have shoulder tears. This goes down into the big bone in your upper arm, which is called the humerus. So the humerus is the supporting bone, right? And if we have a fracture on the humerus, we'll talk about how to deal with humeral fractures later. Uh, the forearm consists of two bones, a radius and an ulna, right? The radius is on the lateral side, the ulna is on the medial side. The way to remember that would be is if you're holding your arm in a supination form, palms up, think of the fact of the ulna being underneath of the U, underneath, and your radius goes on the top. The other way to remember your radius is you check your radial pulse, right? So just below the saddle joint into the wrist, okay? On the radial bone down in the little divot, you're gonna feel a pulse, All right? That's called a radial pulse. That's where you're gonna locate that one there. So the hand um, has ball and socket joint along with synovial joints, which are these here, okay? In this, we have five bones across. These are called your, your um, metacarpals. And the way they're listed as metacarpal one, metacarpal two, and three, four, and five. In your thumb, you only have two bones. All right, before we get into that, each finger is called a phalange, okay? So phalanges are fingers. Breaking that down even more. Uh, there's two bones within the thumb. It's called a proximal and distal phalanx or phalange. In your four fingers, there's three bones. We have our proximal, medial, and distal phalanx, right? So proximal, medial, distal, proximal, medial, distal, right? So there's different parts of the bone. So when we're doing an assessment, we're palpating, you actually want to feel all three bones of the finger to see if there's any kind of fracture. In the wrist, there are eight bones with it located within the wrist. Um, and each bone has a name. We're not going to get into that. Um, but I need you guys to know that there are eight bones and they're called carpal bones within the wrist. So looking at the hand, we have our ulna radius. Okay. Um, we have eight bones in the wrist called the carpals, five bones on the top of the hand, metacarpals, fingers or phalanges, and they're broken down by distal, medial, and proximal. All right, any questions with that at all? No, I'm all set. All right. Perfect. So a very common fracture you'll see with this, and we'll get more to this like I said, in musculoskeletal injuries, is something called a Collie's fracture. So Collie's fracture is when someone falls and they're going to catch themselves and land on the palm of their hand, they end up getting a fracture in the wrist up in here. That's what they call a Collie's fracture. So you might see that this may be common. The best splint to use for these are a SAM splint um, and splint the wrist in place. We'll go over that more in musculoskeletal. The pelvis is a closed bony ring consisting of three bones. We have two pelvic bones. Each pelvic bone is formed by fusion of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Then we have our sacrum. All right, let's go to that next. So posteriorly, the ilium and ischium and the pubis bones are joined by the sacrum. Okay. So in the bone, there's different parts of. And we'll get into these. The uh, uh, via cava and descending the descending aorta in a moment, All right? So we have the iliac crest, which is the top of the pelvic bone, going into the ilium, which is the actual bone here, 
which then attaches to the sacrum, which is here, okay? As we break it down a little bit farther, the ischium is located down low, the acetabulum is located on the side here, and then here is your symphysis pubis, okay? This is what fuses together through each side of the pelvis. So our pubis bones are located here, symphysis pubis is together here, the ischial tuberosities are located through the center of the bone. All right. So if we have what they call a, a for a pelvic fracture, okay, and they have a symphysis pubis split and it splits between the two. Another name for this is called an open book fracture. Okay. Think of the book opening up. Now you can only imagine how dangerous this really could be, right? So it's a simple fracture. Look what's running through there. You're descending the aorta, okay, going into your femoral arteries, okay? And you also have your femoral veins coming back up, going into your inferior vena cava, carrying the deoxygenated blood, right? Good to know. Because if you sever an artery because you did not splint the pelvis correctly, okay, you can, in your pelvic cavity, can hold up to three liters of blood. Your body, on average, average adult, only has five liters of blood in their system. So you can go in the shock very, very quickly if you sever the femoral artery in the pelvis. Okay, our pelvis protects these arteries until we actually fracture something. And if you fracture it and sever the artery, you're going to bleed out. All right, so I want to make that very important. Notice that it's very important to understand that the pelvic the girdle itself and, and the A and P behind it, because if something happens and you do not stabilize and keep that book closed and you sever the artery, the patient will probably die. Okay, if they have a true bleed. So the lower extremities are the main parts of the thigh, the leg, and the foot. The femur, which is the longest and one of the strongest bones in the body, uh, is broken down into three parts. All right. You have your distal femur, your proximal femur, and mid-shaft femur. So why is that important? Why would you think it would be important to know which, side, which part of the femur is broken? What are your thoughts? Did you say what side of the femur? Yeah, distal proximal and then mid, mid shaft. Is it because of the the veins? One, one runs down one side and one runs down the other. Yeah. Or back up the other. There's one other thing, and that's going to be what type of splint you use. All right. So knowing what kind of splint is. Um, yeah, how you split them, I'm just reading the messages now, I had to pull it down for a moment. All right, so if we have a distal or proximal femur fracture, we can't pull traction on those because you don't know if the knee is involved, so we can't pull traction. If The only time we ever pull traction on a fracture, there's other times we'll do it, we'll talk about that later on. In this lecture here, the only time we do it is if it's mid-shaft. So Take your hands and your fingertips, okay, and put your fingertips together by each hand, right? Now slide your hand on top of one another and, and then have it go together, okay? That's what happens when you have a mid-shaft femur fracture. So the bones slide and they shift in, causing significant amount of pain, right? On top of that, you have major arteries, right? Femoral artery, femoral vein running through there. Your femur can hold on an average of 750 mLs of blood per femur, okay? Significant blood loss, enough to put you in the shock, right? So with that being said, we pull traction to pull those bones back into an inline position. So we pull manual traction and we apply a traction splint to hold that back. 
And you'll actually see, and I've had a, quite a few femur fractures in my time, not me personally, but I've been to calls with, where we pulled that manual traction and that pain level went from a 30 over 10 to like a 7 over 10 because you put it back in line, okay? Because there's so much muscle in your leg um, that you're causing much pain when it, when it pulls back, when it, when, it, sorry, when, it, when it breaks and then makes it smaller area. All right, so the femur being the longest bone in the body connects into the, the acetabulum and the pelvic girdle by a ball and socket joint, All right? That ball and socket joint is called a femoral head. So the femoral head, so femur, femoral, the head part, connects into the ball and socket. So the greater and lesser trochanter are where the major muscles of the thigh connect to the femur. In an elderly patient that falls that complains of pelvic pain, 80% of the time, it's a femoral head fracture, all right? We're gonna treat it the same way. We're gonna split the pelvis. A lot of times the pain reduces quite often. It's almost like one or two over 10, right? Just by putting that pressure on the side. All right, the lower extremities have the knee. The knee connects the upper leg to the lower leg. Then you have a floating patella. A lot of times we'll have patellar dislocations where it shifts, okay? Um, in there, there are a lot of ligaments and there's a lot of tendons as well. They go through your knee and everything else. Um, and again, we get in the musculoskeletal, we'll break it down even more. Um, then we go into the lower leg. So the shin bone, the tibia, think of T for toe, so it's towards the front. And the fibula, not fibia, but fibula, is the lateral side of the leg, so the, so the back side, all right? Or I should say outside, lateral side. So tibia on the front, which is your shin bone, going to your tibia out back, and two bones. So, Sean, that's what we had for a fracture the other day, was a distal tib, fib, or tibia fibula fracture completely through. Now, I have a question about that. Yeah. This might be jumping ahead. Was that a compound technically? Because you said it was poking yeah. through. Yeah, compound, open, compound with multiple bone, open fracture. How did she manage that? I missed that because we came in late. How did how did she manage to do that um, upstairs? Well, she got out of the bed. She slipped on the hardwood floor and she landed her body weight on the lower part of her leg and snapped it. Clean oh, off. fuck. That sounds painful. Yep. Well, it was for her until I gave her meds. Um, <laughs> and, and then she saw pink elephants and purple dinosaurs. But that's besides the point. Um, so, again, lower part of the leg. This goes into the ankle, which is a hinge joint, which allows flexion and extension of the foot. In the ankle, it contains seven bones called the tarsal bones. Okay, and then it's the same thing as the hand, except instead of being calling it carpal, right, like carpal tunnel syndrome, the wrist, we're dealing with tarsals. So there's seven tarsal bones in the ankle that goes down into your metatarsals, like metatarsal one, two, three, four, and five, on the top of the foot, which then go into the toes, which are formed by phalanges, bones, All right? Perfect. So some physiology behind that, the skeletal system gives the body its shape, it protects fragile organs. Remember your thoracic cavity, your rib cage is protecting your heart, your lungs, you know, your pancreas. Uh, vital organs that are there. It gives you protection. Um, it stores calcium, allows for movement, helps create new blood cells. All right, we need that. All right, we need blood cells to move throughout the body to help transport oxygen. These are all important factors. Uh, so the musculoskeletal system also provides form, upright posture movement and protection of vital internal organs. So let's talk about muscles. There are three types of muscles in the body. Skeletal, which are voluntary muscles. Smooth muscles, which you'll find um, like in your lungs, you'll find them in your, in your, um, Intestines. Sorry, I just I had a moment for a minute there. 
Then you have cardiac muscle. So everybody, where would you find cardiac muscle? Heart. In the heart. And that's the only place you're going to find it. All right. Um, so smooth muscles line like the lungs. They line the intestines. And they're smooth because it allows for stuff to flow. All right. Um, cardiac muscle. The thing about cardiac muscle is once it dies, it doesn't usually come back. Um, so it's really not repairable. So if you ever heard the term time is muscle for, for heart attacks, because it is. Because the more time it becomes ischemic, lack of oxygen, will then turn into infarction or infarct, which is tissue, which is muscle and tissue death. Right. We'll talk more about that in cardiology. But you will see this on your national exam and on my exams as well. What are the three types of muscles? Skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. And here is the last picture. And I, this is very tiny on my screen here. Um, so male, female, right? So looking at the different muscles, obviously the back of the arm being triceps, the front of the arm being the bicep, right? Um, the shoulder is called a deltoid. Um, that's where we do a lot of intramuscular injections. Um, the pectoral major, which is your chest muscle, your pecs, pectoral muscles. Um, in your in your backside, looking at, at your butt, you have the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus, right? So different parts of the muscles within the backside, All right? You have your quadriceps, so think of your quads. So you're going to do a lateral quadricep muscle as we're going to do IM injections for epinephrine. And then your calf muscle, I can't know why they just can't call it a calf muscle, but it's called a gastrocnemius muscle, right? Um, there are other muscles in the neck as well, like the sternocleidomastoid muscles, and there's a lot of other ones that are located up there as well. Um, nothing that you guys really need to get into. Uh, but it's important to know which muscles are the major muscles of the body. So your biceps, triceps, deltoid, uh, pectorals, uh, the gluteus, the rectus abdom abdominis, which is your abdominal muscles. Um, <clears throat> so utilizing those as well. Um, the best way to do this is take a picture or whatever, excuse me, take a picture of like the screen you have down in front of you uh, and then cross out or white out all the names and then just make a photocopy of that and fill things in on your own. It helps you memorize these muscle names, all right? Same thing with the bones too. Take the diagrams, cross out the names, then photocopy that. Um, that and that way you'll have a blank copy and you can just write in the names and memorization that way. Uh, just different helpful study tips. Uh, the, <clears throat> the muscular system uh, physiology here, muscular skeletal uh, contraction and relaxation of the system make it possible to move and manipulate the environment, which is the byproduct of the movement is heat. Another function of the muscle is to protect the structures underneath them as well. So the more muscle you have, the better protection you have under with the uh, structures underneath it. So one thing to remember, like as far as muscles and how that works. Um, so if you get cold, what happens? What do you do? You start to shiver. You start to shiver, right? By shivering, allows for involuntary shaking of muscles, which then starts producing heat. Right. So you have different regulators in the body. You have thermal regulators. You have, um, <clears throat> if you're too hot, your body sweats to cool down, okay? If you're too cold, your body shivers to create heat, okay? So another function of the muscles, but also protect them as well. So again, we'll talk about environmental emergencies later in regards to what happens if you stop sweating or stop shivering, but we'll get to that point later. But uh, the byproduct of the movement of the shaking and the shivering is 
creation of heat to keep the body warm. With the respiratory system, and again, we're gonna go over this more in detail than what you can see on the screen. Um, structures of the body that contribute to respiration, which is the breathing process. Uh, this is gonna be very important. We're gonna be giving medications um, at the EMT level that are gonna really impact the respiratory system, hopefully with a positive outcome. We're gonna be utilizing uh, continuous positive airway pressure using CPAP. It's now within the scope of practice for New Hampshire and Maine for the EMT level. And we're going to have medications as well behind this, inlining medications. So we're going to show you guys the CPAP modules as well. Um, so we're going to break down the uh, upper versus lower airway. So the upper airway includes the nose, the mouth, and the, which is the oral cavity, and the tongue, along with the mandible and the larynx. The larynx divides upper and lower airway. So at that larynx, I'll go back to the picture in a moment, divides the two, upper to lower. The pharynx also includes the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx. And I'll show you guys that again in the picture in a moment. In your trachea, you have your epiglottis, then you have your esophagus, okay? Once you pass the Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage, you start getting into the lower airway, okay? Then you have your cricoid cartilage, and immediately below that is your thyroid cartilage. And then between that is the cricothyroid membrane. So if you pick your neck up and you can find your trachea, you start palpating down, you're going to find your cricoid cartilage and your thyroid cartilage. That little divot in between is called the cricothyroid membrane. That's not very important to you guys as much as it is to the paramedic level, because that's where we would do a crike on somebody, where we cut a hole and, and put a tube in through there. That would be the location for that. The trachea ends at the carina, coming down. So your trachea comes down, and it goes through a split right and left. Okay, at that split, that that split area, the Y connection right there, is called the carina, dividing the right and left bronchi, leading into the bronchioles into the alveoli. Let me go back now. So looking at this picture here, okay, we have our nasopharynx up here, nasal passaging. Okay, we have the oropharynx, which goes into the pharynx, which is all this together, okay? This goes down into the epi where the epiglottis is located. The epiglottis is a flap of skin that kind of goes back and forth. So when you breathe, it covers the esophagus. When you swallow, it covers the trachea, okay? Which goes into the larynx. In the larynx is where your voice box is gonna be located as well. That goes down through the trachea, which is located here, into the lower airway where it branches off in your right and left main stem bronchi. That's the carina. Then it branches off into the smaller pieces that you can see here. Those are your bronchioles. And that goes into the bronchioles here into the alveoli. And in the alveoli, you're gonna find vessels. In those vessels where we have arteries going to arterioles into the capillary beds, these are gonna be your capillary beds that sit almost like that, like capillaries sitting down in here. This is where gas exchange happens. When you breathe in, you bring in that 21% oxygen, okay? It goes into the trachea, down through the bronchial, bronchi to the bronchioles into the alveoli. As you, it goes then it's attached to hemoglobin and blood cells, and then it gets transferred through the body. As it's coming back through, your body is also picking up deoxygenated blood, which also has a byproduct or off gas of carbon dioxide, CO2. That CO2 then gets expelled through expiration. And that's where you have that gas exchange. And we have ways to monitor that expiration phase, and it's called entitled carbon dioxide, entitled CO2 monitoring, all right? So that's where the gas exchange happens. So air comes in, goes through, gets attached 
um, through the alveoli, to, through the blood cells, the hemoglobin, which then starts transporting through the body, getting into the, all the cellular level stuff, it takes all the good stuff, delivers it, picks up the bad stuff, and brings it back so we can off-gas it through exhalation. This is a continuous process. All right. So back to the lungs. There are two lungs that are held in place by the trachea, the arteries and veins, and the pulmonary ligament. All right. Each lung is divided into lobes. The right lung has three lobes, an upper, a middle, and a lower. The left lung has an upper and a lower lobe only. Why do you think that is? Space. What was that? Space in the chest cavity. Space, right? <clears throat> and what is taking up that space for that lobe, that middle lobe that you would have on the left side? The liver. What was that? The liver. I'll go a little bit higher than, oh, well, more to the left. I should say. Heart. The heart. So the heart takes that place. So have you ever heard of um, lobe specific pneumonia? Have you ever heard of that before? When you have pneumonia, it's usually specific to a lobe. You guys heard of that before? No. So when you have pneumonia or an infection, right? in the lung, a pulmonary infection. Usually it's not diffuse, like, like throughout the entire lungs, okay? Unlike congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, right? They'll be more lobe specific. You could have bilateral pneumonia on both sides, but usually it'd be more specific to a specific lobe of the, of the, of the lung that has that infection, that inflammation, right? Uh, so that's where that lobe pneumonia comes into play. That's why it's so important when you listen to lung sounds, not just to listen to the uppers only, but look at all the different lobes and listen to see where you might find some of that 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 junky sound, like that rock eye sound. So then the lobes are bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. The alveoli allows for that gas exchange we talked about. Uh, the pleura, which is a smooth, glistening tissue that covers each lung and lines the chest cavity. Right, that allows between the two layers is a small amount of fluid that allows tissues to glide smoothly, right? So that's allowing our lungs to expand and then reinflate, re deflate, reinflate, deflate. Okay. Um, but you also have to have within the, let's see, go to the next slide here. And go back to here. Right, but looking at the lungs also, you have something called surfactant as well, which we'll get into in a little bit. And surfactant allows for the elasticity um, of the alveoli to expand and contract. All right, so without surfactant, that can't happen. And if there's no surfactant, our alveoli can collapse, allowing for it not to function at all. Therefore, we're not going to get good gas exchange. So why is all this important? Why is it important to know how air goes in, air comes out, and understand how alveoli work? Why do you think it would be important? I'm hearing some stuff, but it's pretty quiet. Any thoughts? I have a thought, but I'm probably wrong. Does it have to do with being like toxic gas? Not not really toxic gas, but being toxic. If I'm saying that right, you mean being more like septic? Maybe. Yeah. So, but good good thought process behind it. Um, so uh, Emily put down tissue perfusion, um, and then Nick asked me to ask the question again. Um, why is it important to understand the process of how you have inhalation, exhalation, gas exchange? So what we're looking for is, is 
how about disease process? Uh, so we have a patient with like COPD, emphysema, bronchitis, asthma, right? Different processes, COVID being another one, how that works within the system, okay? Uh, understanding how the process works will allow you to be able to tell the difference of how a patient is off-gassing based upon a diagnosis like COPD, okay? Uh, or a patient who has asthma that's having um, an asthma attack, okay? When we take a deep breath in and we take a breath out, everybody in the class, okay, take a breath in and a breath out, right? We're taking a breath in, our lungs expand, right? We have gas exchange happening. All the alveoli are working right now. We're having good gas exchange. If you have a patient that has a deviation to that, like COPD or asthma, what's going to happen is your alveoli are not all going to off-gas at the same time. Okay, therefore, you're not getting adequate exchange. Asthmatics have buildup of mucus. No different than a patient that has COPD can have buildup of mucus like bronchitis. Or, or they can have very dry lung like patients that have emphysema. Okay, so understanding how that gas exchange is working can help you with your treatments and why we're doing what we're doing by giving a patient like, say, a nebulizer to help with that um, help with that bronchodilation to allow for a better gas exchange so that we're there, their pulse oximeter readings aren't like 60%, okay? So again, understanding the ins and outs of how the lungs work will help you have a better understanding if a patient is in a COPD issue, what we call a COPD, a COPD exacerbation, or if you have a patient who's having an asthma attack, or they have pneumonia, or they have um, even COVID, okay? With COVID pneumonia, why these patients need these oxygen because their alveoli cannot exchange the gas appropriately, right? So we look at all that as a whole. That's why it's important to be able to have the understanding behind anything respiratory and what we can do, right? So looking at here on this picture of the lungs, we have you know right and left lungs here. Uh, we have our thyroid and cricoid cartilage. That's the cricothyroid membrane in the middle here. That goes down to the carina and branches off into all these wonderful alveoli and uh, bronchial bron bronchi and bronchioles. All right. So let's go to the next one here. Um, as far as muscles of breathing go, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles are the primary muscles of breathing. Okay. So if we take a breath in, our lungs expand, go to lacticity, and then as we exhale, right, which is not a process of any kind of movement. Because it's so elastic of the lungs, it then runs, runs off a negative pressure system, allowing it to decrease um, and move air in and out. And all this is done with our cervical muscles, our neck, our abdominal muscles, and our pectoral muscles that help with this. All right. So the diaphragm, obviously, being the primary muscle of breathing, which divides and divides the thorax from the abdomen. His automatic function um, for this is breathing. Okay, so the intercostal muscles during inhalation, um, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract, right, moving the ribs up and out, enlarging the chest cavity, decreasing the pressure in the lungs, and then moving air in. Okay, during exhalation phase, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles re relax, decreasing the chest cavity, increasing the pressure in the lungs. And moving the air back out. That's why I mentioned our system runs on a negative pressure. If we have a hole in the lung, like a stab wound, right, or an open type of wound, where we can't have adequate air function, our lung will start to collapse. Okay, we'll get into that over trauma. Let me get into that part. So the function of the respiratory system is to provide oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide. The air must come in, the toxic must come out, right? allowing for good gas exchange. Ventilation and respiration are two separate independent functions of the respiratory system. Right? Ventilation, um, we'll talk about that here in a second here. Respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli and the tissues, which provide oxygen to the cells and removes waste carbon dioxide. Diffusion 
is the passive process of which oxygen molecules move from areas with a higher concentration of oxygen molecules to an area of lower concentration of oxygen molecules. And our brain stem is what controls our breathing. Okay, so if we have any kind of brain stem herniation, we can stop breathing. And herniation of the brain stem can happen from trauma or even a massive bleed to the point where there's no more room for pressure and it herniates. All right. So what happens in respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the alveolar tissue level body. Remember that it provides much needed oxygen to the cells, removes the waste carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is bad for our system. Oxygen passes through the blood, from the blood, through the capillaries to the tissues. That's how we have tissue perfusion. The carbon dioxide then passes back as a, as a waste product. Um, diffusion being the passive process which oxygen molecules move from higher to lower concentration, and the brainstem automatically controls the breathing at the levels of carbon dioxide or oxygen in the arterial blood is too high or too low, which therefore, it'll have the patient breathing faster or slower. This will all make sense when a patient's in shock, when they start seeing tachycardia and tachypnea, right? So a patient who's in shock will have a faster heart rate to pump blood faster through the body to oxygenate the cells from tissue perfusion, and it'll have you breathing faster to bring more oxygen in. It's your body's way of compensating um, the system. The medulla oblongata senses pH changes in the cerebral spinal fluid, and then also signals the diaphragm to start breathing. The hypoxic drive is the backup system that controls breathing, okay? So I'll pick up that. It is less sensitive and more powerful than carbon dioxide sensors in the brain step. So if your system starts shutting down, there's other backup systems that help you. But eventually everything will shut down and the patient will go into failure. These are the patients that need quick ALS intervention. The medulla initiates um, ventilation cycles stimulated by high carbon dioxide levels. So your body knows when your carbon dioxide is high and your medulla says, hey, we're going to start ventilating. Um, the pons, um, which have two areas that help augment respiration is during emotional and physical stress. This still involves in changing the depth of respiration, expiration, and or both. The medulla, which helps keep us breathing, so we don't have to think about it. Okay, so we don't have to think about breathing. Our body will automatically breathe because our medulla oblongata says we have to. What happens is it initiates the ventilation cycle, which is stimulated by high, high carbon dioxide levels in your system, which then sets the base pattern for respiration. All right. Does that all make sense? I'm trying to go a little more in depth with you guys so you have more of an understanding of how it works. You guys good with that? I don't want to confuse you. Yeah, okay, awesome. So now we have respiration. Now we're talking about ventilation. Ventilation is simple air movement into and out of the lungs. Requires chest rise and fall, requires tidal volume, which is the amount of air moved in or out of the lungs during a single breath. Then we have residual volume, which is the gas that remains in the lungs to keep the lungs open. Okay, usually about 200 mLs of air. Roughly sits at the bottom as residual, 150, 200, depending on what book you read, and tell you the difference. The dead space is a portion of respiratory system that has no alveoli and where little or no exchange of gas between air and blood occurs. To figure out minute volume, again, these are things you guys need to know is how to, tell, um, how to figure out minute volume. It's your respiratory rate times tidal volume, okay, equals minute volume. So minute volume is the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs in one minute minus the dead space. To calculate that again, respiratory rate times tidal volume equals minute volume. Always evaluate the amount of air being moved with each breath when assessing the patient's respirations. 
just because they're breathing 12 times a minute does not mean they have adequate ventilation, okay? If it's shallow or deep, they're taking in either too much carbon dioxide or not enough. We have to fix that problem, whether it be with a ventilation using a BVM or you call for ALS intervention to help fix that. Tidal volume on an average is about four to six liters, depending on the patient and size. So the normal rate and depth, which is tidal volume, all right, you have the regular rhythm or pattern of, in of inhalation and exhalation. You have clear audible breath sounds on both sides of the chest. This is for normal breathing. Regular rise and fall movement of both sides of the chest, so good up and down. I'll show you guys how to assess that on Sunday. And then movement of the abdomen. If you have inadequate breathing, You're going to see labored breathing. You'll see muscle retractions. The patient will become pale, cyanotic, cool, or damp skin. Because remember, if they're inadequate breathing, we're not getting proper gas exchange, which then turns into the patient becoming um, or developing symptoms of shock. You'll see them in a tripod position, or they'll be gasping for air. So a body's mechanism to help fix this is something called PEEP. PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure, okay? Our bodies run normally, okay, with a PEEP of five. Our trachea, our glottic opening, okay, um, and our vocal cords as well help with that PEEP. So if a patient is intubated with an endotracheal tube, they lose their ability to have PEEP. Therefore, we have to provide the ventilation for them and give them PEEP behind it. So let's talk about PEEP anyways. Positive and expiratory pressure. I'm hoping everybody at home is participating because I would make sure you're doing this in the classroom. Everybody take a deep breath, mouth open, in and out. Right? Good breath. Lungs open, lungs close. Now take a deep breath in and exhale with pursed lips, like you're kissing somebody. In, pursed lips, and breathe back out again. Did you notice that your lungs stay open for a longer period of time? You guys got that? Yeah. Right? That is called PEEP. Okay? That the body's compensatory mechanism to say, hey, I can't breathe, and they start doing per slip breathing. So patients that have COPD, or if you ever know a patient on oxygen, you'll see them do the like that, right? And they're speaking two to three words at a time before the next breath. They're provide, trying to have a mechanism your body kicks in to provide PEEP to keep that lung open longer to allow for oxygen exchange. Okay, those are patients that have COPD or become COPD exacerbation, uh, which means it's a very worse case, which need to be treated with medicine. All right, they create their own PEEP, inadequate breathing patterns, muscle retractions, tripod, labored breathing, pursed lip breathing, things like that. All right, any questions on respiratory? No. That's kind of a lot of information, I know. But again, the more you read it, the more you see it, the more you see it and on a call, then you'll understand, hey, I remember Kevin telling me about that. That's pretty cool. Not for the patient, but for you to see. All right. The circulatory system, anatomy, right, is a complex arrangement of connected tubes. Think of a fire pump, right? Arterials, sorry, arteries, which go, which are the bigger vessels which go into arterioles, a little bit smaller, in the capillaries, which you'll see on the top of your hand, okay? Capillary beds, top of the skin. Gas exchange happens. It goes to a venule and then to the veins. Inside venules and veins, there are valves. In arteries, it's straight. 
there's no valves in between, okay? Arteries are under pressure. Once it passes the capillary bed, there's no more pressure anymore being pushed by the heart to pump. Therefore, you have to have valves. So what's happening is, is the blood filling up builds up its own pressure and pushes through the valve into the next chamber. Think of different chambers, okay? Um, there are two circuits in the system. There's a systemic circulation, which is the body, and there's pulmonary circulation, which is in the lungs. All right. So we're going to go over this here in a moment, more in depth. But this is the picture here. You need to have the understanding of how the drop of blood works, where it starts and where it ends. Um, you will see this stuff on National Registry exam. Two of the big topics they cover are respiratory and cardiac emergencies and anatomy and physiology between the two. So if you haven't, like again, I'm only covering the highlights of this stuff. You guys need to go back and make sure you read the books, the ebook online. All right, so the heart is a hollow muscular organ that is approximately the size of an adult's clenched fist, okay? So if you make a fist, that's about the size of your heart. It is made of specialized cardiac muscle, which works as two paired pumps. The septum divides the right and the left side. This is going to be very important when we start talking about heart failure. We'll get into more into cardiology. Each side is divided into an atrium and a ventricle. The upper chamber is the atrium. The ventricle is the lower, is the lower chamber. All right, we'll get into pictures here momentarily. Circulation is the, when the heart receives its blood from the aorta, okay? Oxygenated blood. The right side receives deoxygenated blood from the veins, right? The left side receives oxygenated blood from the lungs, all right? So I'm going to have to go over that here, more in pictures here in a moment. All right. Again, very small on my screen here, um, so hard to see. But you have four chambers of the heart. You have the right atrium, deoxygenated blood comes in. It goes through four different valves. So you have a valve here. Um, you have the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve going in the pulmonary system. Then you have the mitral valve and the aortic valve. All right. We're in EMS. So remember, sometimes we think of different ways to remember things. Four valves of the heart in order. TPMA, tricuspid, mitral, pulmonic, aortic. Toilet paper, my ass. Don't forget it. <laughs> and you probably won't forget that ever again now. Um, that's how I remembered it through school. That's why it was always taught in all my programs I've taken in the past. Do I remember it? Um, blood comes in. The oxygenated blood comes in through the right ventricle, goes through into the, sorry, right atrium, the right ventricle, goes into the lungs, going into the lungs at that point in time. It, now the oxygenated blood goes into the alveoli, carbon dioxide is expelled. New oxygen is coming in. We have oxygenated blood now coming through the aorta, going in through the right atrium to the right ventricle, which, I'm sorry, left atrium, left ventricle, and then pumps out to the body. Body is now perfusing, it's being transported appropriately, right? And then the cycle starts all over again. Did I lose anybody on that at all? I'm keeping it very simple. Deoxygenated blood, right side. <coughs> Oxygenated blood, left side. Gas exchange happens in the lungs, in the alveoli, in the pulmonary system. With no questions, I'll move forward. All right. The normal resting heart rate for an adult, this is an adult, we're not even talking about pediatrics, okay, is 60 to 100. You might want to memorize these numbers. Anything less than 60 is considered bradycardia. Anything greater than 100 is considered tachycardia. All right. Stroke volume is the amount of blood moved by one beat. 
cardiac output is the amount of blood moved over one minute. So what we do is we take our heart rate times our stroke volume, and that gives us our cardiac output. All right, the electrical conduction system, All right? There are different parts of the electrical conduction system. It causes smooth muscles co with coordinated contractions, and the contractions produce a pumping action. There are different pathways within the heart that, that are utilized to help deliver that electrical charge to cause the heart to pump. All right. The first one is called the sinoatrial node, which is the SA node. That has an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. That then travels through internodal pathways, okay, into the next node. Now the next, um, the next node is called the atrial ventricular node, the AV node, all right? If the SA node were to fail and the AV node were to kick in, that's like your backup generator, the intrinsic rate for that is 40 to 60 beats per minute. Once it passes through the AV node, it goes through the bundle of hiss and goes down the right and left bundle branch of the heart into what they call Purkinje fibers, which then stimulates the ventricles to fire, to allow the blood to be pumped either into the lungs, deoxygenated blood to the lungs, or on the left side of the case, left ventricular function, pushes left ventricle blood through the heart, I mean through the body. So when you take your pulse, everybody take your pulse really quick on your radial artery, you, you guys feel the beat, right? Yes, beats, yes. Everybody has a heart today? Yes. Y yes, that beat you are feeling is your ventricle contracting, okay? That's your ventricular contraction when you feel a beat. That's how powerful that electrical impulse is to fire that ventricle, to push that blood through the entire body. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? It's really cool. Joy, I'm very happy that you're not dead today. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Deb, you have a question. Feel free to speak up. That is not something that I want to discuss in this lecture at this point in time. <laughs> um, but yes, we can talk about it off time if you want, though. We can go over CV blocks and everything else. Um, there's a lot of different, in the conduction system, um, that's when you do a 12 lead EKG. There's a whole bunch of different um, rhythms you can interpret based on the conduction system. And that's something that I could teach after an EMT class or someone wanted to learn something off time. Nothing that I would do during a class because it's not part of your scope of practice. But um, very interesting stuff, Deb, too. And yes, Nick, it is a lot to take in. That's why I said everything that we do um, is based on A and P and how we're going to treat our patients. You know, if we don't have an understanding of how the conduction system works, even as an ALS provider, how can we treat it? We, we, we learn, as a paramedic, we learn 110 different medications that we can administer um, to a patient to help treat them, whether it be respiratory, cardiac, endocrine, whatever it may be, okay? We have to under, have the understanding of how those medications work within the system to speed up the heart, to slow down the heart, you know, things like that. You guys are doing stuff at the EMT level um, by giving somebody nitrates, which is going to vasodilate a patient, all right? to help them get oxygen to the blood, but also in turn will drop blood pressure. So we'll, again, cardiology, we're gonna cover that kind of stuff later on. Um, but there is a lot behind it. Again, taking the time to learn it is amazing. And cardiology is actually pretty fun. But let's break it down a little bit more. Uh, so with that being said, the electrical conduction system is a network of specialized tissue that is capable of conducting electrical current that runs throughout the heart. 
your heart produces enough current to literally to run the electrical system of a home. That's how powerful your heart is. The flow of electrical current causes smooth muscle coordinated heart contractions, which then allows the heart to pump. The contractions then produce a pumping action of the heart. Each mechanical contraction is associated with two electrical processes. One is called depolarization. Okay, so when you feel that beat and a pulse, and a pulse, that is your ventricle pumping, or what they call depolarizing, which is an electrical charge of the surface of the muscle cell uh, change from a positive to a negative. Okay, then you have repolarization, where the heart returns to its resting state, and a positive charge is then restored to the surface, allowing for that next pump. Okay. Um, and again, again, I'm not going to get into what an EKG rhythm looks like because that's how you read those. But electrical impulses begin high in the atria at the sinoatrial node, travel to the atrioventricular node to the bundle of Hiss, moving through the Purkinje fibers. And by getting to Purkinje fibers, it has to go through the right and left bundle branch. All right. This movement then produces a smooth flow of electric electricity leading to a coordinated pumping action. So pump, 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 pump. You hear that S1, S2 heart sound, right? Pump, 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 pump. That's what's happening, is you're having depolarization of the atria, depolarization of the ventricle, and then repolarization of both so it can do it all over again. If the conduction system is injured, then the heart will no longer beat properly. That's why it's so important to take care of your heart. Arteries carry the heart, arteries carry blood from the heart to all body tissues. The aorta branches into coronary arteries, <coughs> carotid arteries, hepatic arteries, renal arteries, and mesenteric arteries as well. Uh, once we finish the arteries, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll come back to this. Arteries carry blood from the heart to all body tissues. Uh, they contract to accommodate loss of blood and increase blood pressure, so as to supply tissues needed. The aorta is the main artery leaving the left side of the heart and carrying freshly oxygenated blood to the body. And it has many... Uh, branches that supply the vital organs. One is the coronary arteries, which supply the heart, the carotid arteries, which supply the head, the hepatic artery, arteries, which supply the liver, the renal arteries supply the kidneys, mesenteric arteries supply the digestive system. And with this, it divides all, excuse me, divides at the level of the umbilicus into two iliac arteries. All right, they go down into the legs. The pulmonary artery originates at the right ventricle, which then carries oxygenated poor blood to the lungs. And there, the arteries branches into smaller arteries and then into the arterioles. Arterial branches into a series of increasingly smaller vessels until they connect to a vast network of capillaries. When we start talking about venous, arterial, and capillary bleeding, we talk about trauma, um, you'll be able to tell the difference between the, all three of those and what is actually being, or actually bleeding. Most of the time, you see a lot of capillary bleeds, like cuts on the hand, things like that. But venous blood or arterial bleeding will be a little bit different. Um, a pulse is palpated easily at the neck, which is gonna be your carotid pulse. Uh, the wrist, which is the radial or the groin, which is ephemeral. There are other pulses that you can palpate, uh, another one being behind the knee, which is called a popliteal pulse. And there's another one in the foot called the dorsopedal pulse, which is usually located between your, your big toe and the next toe over. And then you also have what they call a tibial pulse, which you can find on the ankle, down towards the tibia. as you can see on this screen here. And honestly, I cannot even see the words that are on the screen, so I do apologize. 
these are all the different major arteries and veins um, within the system. Memorize the important ones, like the brachial artery, the femoral artery, you know, things like that. Carotid artery, dorsal pedal artery. All right, let's take five minutes. I'm going to pause this here, and we'll come back in five. So let's say we'll come back at 8.45 to kind of finish up. This conference will now be recorded. All right, so we're gonna cover um, capillaries. So they're connected um, arterioles, they connect um, arterioles to venules. So the capillary bed. So think of the top of your hand, top of your skin, um, that's where your capillary beds are located. These are tiny blood vessels that connect arterioles to venules, which allow um, contact between blood and the cells of the tissue. Oxygen and nutrients then pass from blood cells and plasma into the capillaries to individual tissue cells through a very thin walls of the capillary. There are billions of capillaries in the body. We have to have tissue perfusion so our body does not go into shock. Okay, so that's why it's so important. Um, Veins return oxygen depleted blood to the heart. The superior vena cava carries blood returning from the head, neck, and shoulders, and the upper extremities. The inferior vena cava carries blood from the abdomen, pelvis, and the lower extremities, and they join at the right atrium. So remember, return the veins return blood depleted. Where is that? Veins return oxygen depleted blood from the to the heart. Blood moves from the venules to the heart via the network of larger and larger veins. Your major veins in the body are the superior vena cava, which carries blood returning from the head, neck, and shoulders and upper extremities, and the inferior vena cava, which then carries blood from the abdomen, pelvis, and lower extremities. The superior and inferior vena cava then join at the right atrium. And that's where it's gonna go from the atrium to the ventricle, to the lungs, for that gas exchange to happen. The spleen is a solid organ located under the rib cage. The spleen is important to filter blood particularly susceptible to injury from blunt trauma and can lead to severe internal bleeding. Remember, they're a solid organ that have a lot of vessels, right? So remember that the spleen being a solid organ, it filters worn out blood cells, foreign substances, right, and bacteria from the blood. This is a very highly vascular, and it's particularly susceptible to injury and can lead to severe bleeding because of the high vascular surface area. Okay, it leads to that um, from injuries. So we can see a lot of splenic injuries um, in patients involved in like motor vehicle crashes and things like that. So blood composition, so parts of blood. All right, we have plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Blood composition. So plasma, like I will break this down a bit farther. Um, plasma, which is the liquid portion of the blood, um, contains water, which is the primary component. Um, proteins, which is another primary component, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, nutrients, and cellular waste. Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which give blood its color. Right? White blood cells play a role in the body's immune system to help defend against infection. Platelets are essential in the initial formation of blood clotting. 
So why would white blood cell be important for us to know? What are your thoughts? It helps protect illnesses and cancers. Right, and fight infection. So let me throw this at you guys. What happens if a patient's on chemo? Lacking white blood cells. Yeah, the, the white blood cell count is going to be so low that it can't fight off an infection. Right? This is why it's so important to know patients' medical histories. So, elevated white blood cell counts will be meaning that there's an infection within the body. Um, decreased white blood cell counts could actually mean a patient has cancer, um, receiving chemotherapy, you know, things like that. All right, circulatory system. Blood pressure is pressure that exerts against the walls of an artery. Again, you're going to see this again, um, and it will also be under National Registry examination of what blood pressure is, systolic versus diastolic, or systole versus diastole. Systole is when the ventricle, left ventricle, bleh, when the left ventricle of the heart contracts, and it pumps blood from the ventricles into the aorta. So this would be your arteries with pressure, okay? Um, <clears throat> diastole or, uh, would be when the muscle of the ventricle relaxes and the ventricle then fills with blood. So when you're looking at blood pressure readings, a systolic blood pressure would be the high point of a wave and a diastolic blood pressure would be a low point of a wave. So why is this important? It's important because the patient that is hypertensive, let's give you a blood pressure of 280 over 120, okay, is not allowing for the system to relax. By doing so, um, and having a high diastolic pressure and a high systolic pressure um, will then in turn have a patient have a vessel blow. Okay. Patients that have high blood pressure that are very high can develop acute pulmonary edema, back of a fluid into the lungs. They can also have strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, and they can have a vessel pop in the brain. All right. The way to check a blood pressure, and again, you might see this as a term used, is a sphygmo, uh, my goodness, sphygmomanometer is the term for blood pressure cuff. And you may see that on a test as well. The normal circulation in an adult is automatically adjusted and controlled by the body system. All right. <clears throat> Oh yeah, exactly, Joy. <laughs> Those big long words. Uh, perfusion is circulation of blood in an organ or tissue in adequate amounts to meet the needs of the cell. Adequate state of tissue perfusion. If you have an inadequate state of tissue perfusion, that's when we start seeing shock, and that's actually the definition of shock. As you can see here, and we've hit this multiple times already, Blood enters the organ and the tissues through arteries, which then um, then blood leaves the organ and the tissues through veins. So oxygenated blood comes in, gets transferred over, goes to the cell, perfuses, bad stuff comes out, carbon dioxide goes through the veins, and it's expelled through um, expiration. Inadequate system, we start seeing vessels constricting. So the system can adjust to small blood loss. So a vessel is hard to constrict, and the heart pumps more rapidly, right, to allow for a faster oxygen push out to the system, 
with a large loss, adjustment then fails, and the patient goes into shock. There's three types of shock we gotta be familiar with. One is compensated shock. The second one is decompensated shock. And the third one is irreversible shock. Irreversible means you're going to die at that point. All right, so an adequate circulation in adult, remember the system, I mean, adjust, but can be expressed by the following formula. And one of the things we're going to look for in, in blood pressures and things like that are what they call a mean arterial pressure, MAP or MAP. It's your heart rate times your stroke volume times systemic vascular resistance equals your MAP. Okay, and we'll cover that more later on when we get into more of the cardiology stuff. But patients that have low MAPs are not perfusing appropriately. And one of the things we see low MAPs in are patients that are septic. Septic shock patients have low MAPs, and so they need fluid. They need pressors, you know, things like that. So we'll, we'll cover that more when we start getting into medical emergencies. The function of the blood is to perfuse, to oxygenate, to transport the bad stuff like carbon dioxide, waste, nutrients. It also helps in coagulation, clotting. These are the general functions of blood. Um, the nervous system controls the cardiovascular system. There's two types. There's a sympathetic and a parasympathetic system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or flight. All right. So I'm going to pick on Sean for a minute. If I walked up to Sean and I punched him in the face, he's going to get pissed off, right? Right, Sean? Yes. Okay. Your choice is either to run away or fight back. When I do that, your sympathetic nervous system is now kicked in. Fight or flight. You're going to run or you're going to fight me. What's happening is that your sympathetic nervous system is sending commands to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands is then releasing epinephrine which is adrenaline, and norepinephrine, which is noradrenaline, which then are secreted to stimulate heart and blood vessels. By doing so, um, you're going to have dilated, pu dilated pupils. Your heart rate's going to go up. And you're going to either, like I said, you're going to fight or you're going to run. <clears throat> All right. We start seeing tachycardia, tachypnea, blood pressure goes up, sympathetic nervous system is now kicked in. We give medications at the EMT level that mimic and stimulate this system. And one of them is albuterol, duonebs, um, like that. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. Blood vessels have an alpha adrenergic receptor, alpha one, and they have heart and lung beta adrenergic receptor, which is beta 1, beta 2. If you hear alpha, alpha adrenergic receptors are for vascular, vasculature. Um, beta receptors are rate control, beta 1, and lungs, beta 2. Beta 1, one heart, beta 2, two lungs. All right? The parasympathetic nervous system also has an effect on the cardiovascular system which addresses actions that do not require immediate response. The parasympathetic system is what they used to call the feed or breathe, sleeping at night. That's actually going to be your parasympathetic system. All right? You're going to see a decrease in heart rate and things like that. Your body's going to slow down. It's completely opposite. Um, from that and your neurotransmitter like what you would see for the sympathetic system being norepinephrine and epinephrine is what they call acetylcholine the acetylcholine would be your um, neuroreceptor for the parasympathetic system the nervous system um, is perhaps the most complex organ in the body it's absolutely amazing the things that it can do and it's divided into two main portions um, the central nervous system, which is your spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system, everything that goes off the spinal cord. Um, 
your brain, um, the central nervous system and the brain and the spinal cord um, is what controls the organ of the is, is the controlling organ of the body, the brain. It controls everything. That is your entire control center, right? The brain stem, the cerebellum, the cerebrum, all that controls our body. Uh, the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain, and there are major subdivisions of that, one being the cerebrum, two, um, it breaks it down in the four lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital. Each is responsible for the specific functions such as, excuse me, sight, hearing, balance, and speech. It also controls activities on the opposite side of the body. Uh, the cerebellum coordinates body movements, and the brainstem controls body functions necessary for life, including cardiac and respiratory functions and regulation of consciousness. There are three areas um, within that. That's your midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, which we already covered before in one of the previous slides. So Joy, I just saw your message, I do apologize. What do you mean by the freeze response? Just so I can make sure I get that right. Okay, yeah, okay, sorry about that. I didn't see the message before I had to move down a little bit. Um, <laughs> yes, the freeze response, when you you kind of sit there and go, oh, God, what do I do next? Eventually, you're going to make a decision. Either you're going to fight back or you're going to run. Deer in the headlights. Yeah, exactly, Deb. So as you can look on the picture here, uh, the spinal cord is an extension of the brain stem. So your central nervous system starts up here and runs down through the entire spinal cord. And everything that branches off is peripheral. This transmits messages between the brain and the body. So if you touch a hot surface, um, it travels through your, spi through your um, spinal cord, through your nervous system, and goes, hey, stupid, take your hand off that hot plate. Ouch, it hurts. Right? That's where your nerve endings and all attach, um, attach to your nervous system, peripheral to central to the brain to say, hey, do that. So the spinal cord obviously being the extension which we talked about already, right? Which is made up of the nerve fibers, which we already hit, um, which transmit messages between the brain and the body. This is encased within the spinal canal. So there's a canal that runs from the top to bottom within your spinal cord, within, within your vertebrae. Your vertebrae protect that from, from being injured. Now, in there, you have cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, okay, which is within the brain, right? and the spinal cord. CSF kind of gives it that cushion of protection, right? Can that CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, come out of the body? What do you guys think? Yes. Absolutely, it can be. It can happen. Um, so, Sean, you gotta take off? He may be off. I don't know. All right. So like Nick said, can or should? Um, it should not come out of the body, but it can come out of the body with injury. All right. The way to test it, it's going to be a clear fluid that comes and leaks out. Now, I'm not saying you should do this with every patient, but if you take like a four by four or two by two and you collect that cerebral spinal fluid, you'll have something called like a halo mark on it. And what will happen is you'll see like a yellow halo, like a ring. Right, and if you see that ring, that's cerebral spinal fluid. Where would the common places be where that would come out? Nose, ears. Yep, nose and ears. And you'll see a clear liquid. Um, so oh. motor vehicle accident, significant head trauma. Do you see blood? Um, Check it, look for that halo response. 
If you get a golden yellow halo response, it's CSF, right? Um, that's not good when that starts leaking out. We'll cover more of that when we talk about head trauma. Right, so the peripheral nervous system is divided into the somatic and autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to cough for a minute there. Uh, consists of long fibers that extend from the cell body out through the opening into the bony covering to form a cable of nerve fibers that link the CS uh, central nervous system to the various organs of the body. And divisions would be these two uh, that separate. The somatic nervous system transmits signals from the brain to voluntary muscles, which allows for activities such as walking, talking, writing. The autonomic nervous system, which is involuntary, uh, controls involuntary actions necessary for basic body function, digestion, dilation, constriction of blood vessels, sweating, which then split into two different areas, which we talked about the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. There are two types of nerves within the peripheral system. There's a sensory nerve system, which carries information from the body to the CNS, and motor nerve system, which carry information from CNS to muscle. All right, so we're almost there. The integumentary system, which is the skin, which is also, by the way, for testing purposes, is the largest organ in the body, which is the integumentary system, the skin, has different layers. The first layer is the epidermis, the top layer. The second layer going in is the dermis, and then the subcutaneous tissue, which lies beneath the skin, is your third layer which is a fat that insulates and serves as energy reservoir, right? So the next picture I'm gonna show you guys is actually the layers of the different skin. And in there, there are different vessels and um, different parts that we're gonna go over here with you guys right now. So obviously the hair coming out goes into something called a hair follicle, which is down here. Um, you have sweat glands, which are located here, which allow for sweating. You have sebaceous glands, you have the, I'm trying to see if I can find it on here. Obviously, pores where sweat comes out. Um, the erector pili muscle is what it's called. You ever notice when your hair stands up erect? That's what's happening. The erector pili muscle stands your hair and puts it up in an erect position. Um, down below, we have blood vessels in here. As we go down lower, we have the subcutaneous fat. The layer between the muscle and the fat is called a fascia. So the fascia goes right down through. And this is our subcutaneous tissue, right? So you'll be able to see this depending on the type of um, injury that we have for laceration or cut. So the skin obviously being the largest single organ in the body has three major functions. One, it protects the body in the environment, which means it protects the body from infectious organisms. Number two, it regulates body temperature. So sweat is secreted into the skin surface from the sweat glands, which I showed you before in the previous picture. And three, it transmits information from the environment to the brain. The skin reacts to pressure, pain, and pleasurable stimuli. The digestive system, digestion system, um, is the processing of food that nourishes the cells. Our abdomen is the second major body cavity, which contains major organs of digestion and excretion. We talked about before, comes in four different quadrants, right? Here's what you need to know. The esophagus runs down into the stomach. So the stomach is located where? Looking at this picture. Right next to the left up below the heart. Yep, left so upper. Left, left upper quadrant, exactly. Remember, we're looking at their 
anatomical position, right? So we have our bile duct, our liver is located on the right. So the palpate the liver, you should always feel about two to four centimeters of a liver. Anything more than that would be something that would be inflamed. What you do is you take your hands, rub it along the rib cage. Right? You locate the rib cage. You take a deep breath in. On an exhalation, you roll your fingers underneath the rib cage and you can palpate the liver. Right? The gallbladder is also located on the right upper quadrant, along with your bile ducts. Your large intestines run through the upper and lower quadrants. Your appendix is located in the right lower quadrant and what they call McBurney's point. McBurney's point is located about a, if you take a quarter of the way down and three quarters of the way up from your pelvic and a quarter way down from the umbilical area and you palpate there. That's where your appendix is located if you have one. Your spleen is located on the would be the lateral aspect of the right upper, sorry, left upper quadrant will be your spleen, right? So when you're driving or you're a passenger, a passenger in a motor vehicle accident and they, and they T-bone you, what's on that left side? Your spleen. A lot of times we see splenic ruptures because of this, okay? Those are certain things are located. Uh, the digestive system consists of the mouth, which consists of the, le the, the lips, the cheeks, the gums, teeth, and tongue. The salivary glands, which are two sets, one on each side of the mouth and in front of each ear. Saliva, remember, it serves as a binder for chewed, uh, for chewed food and as a lubricant. The oropharynx, which is a tubular structure, which extends from the back of the mouth to the esophagus and trachea. The esophagus, which is a collapsible tube about 10 inches long, extends from the end of the pharynx to the stomach. The muscles in the wall of the esophagus propel food uh, to the stomach. The stomach is a hollow organ in the left upper quadrant, which receives food and stores it and provides it um, for movement into the bowel. The pancreas is a flat, solid organ that lies between. I'm sorry, lies below and between the liver and the stomach. And there are two portions. There's endocrine and exocrine. Exocrine portion secretes pancreatic juice containing enzymes that aid in digestion of the fat, starch, and proteins. The endocrine portion, or the islets of Langerhan, produce insulin and glucagon. So why is that important? Diabetics. The liver, which is a large solid organ immediately beneath the diaphragm of the right lower upper quadrant, sorry, upper quadrant, which extends into the left upper quadrant, which is the largest solid organ in the abdomen made up of a large mass of blood vessels and cells. Your liver is important because when you give oral medications, it passes through the liver as a first pass event. Um, the liver has many functions. It's filtering harmful substances. It forms the factors needed for blood clotting and normal plasma production. It's a principal organ for storing sugar and starch for immediate use by the body for energy. It also has, and then the bile ducts, which is the major function of the bile is to digest fat. Bile ducts connect to the liver and the intestines. Um, the gallbladder is a small pouch um, that extends from the bile ducts that serves as a reservoir for con uh, concentrating organ and bile produced from the liver. The small intestines, which is a major hollow organ of the abdomen, which produces enzymes and mucus to aid in digestion. It's composed of the, what they call a duodenum, which receives food from the stomach the jejunum, and then the ileum. More than 90% of the products of digestion are absorbed across the wall of the small intestines into the veins. That's how we get our nutrients for our body. The large intestine, which is a major hollow organ consisting of the 
<clears throat> the colon, the rectum, and the the cecum. Um, and the major function of the colon is to absorb the final five and ten percent of digested food and water from the intestines to form solid stool. The appendix, which is three to four inches long tube that opens into the the cecum, which is the first part of large intestines in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. It may easily become obstructed, inflamed, or infected, which would be appendicitis. Appendicitis is one of the major causes of severe abdominal distress. The rectum, which is the lowermost end of the, of the colon, is a large hollow organ adapted to hold quantities of, of feces until it's expelled um, at its terminal end of the anus. And then also both the rectum and the anus have sphincters, which are complex circular muscles that control and escape liquid, gases, and solids from the digestive tract. Um, some of the philosophy behind this were the enzymes that are added to food by salivary glands, stomach, liver, pancreas, and small intestines. And food is converted into basic sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids which are further processed by the liver and circulated via blood throughout the body. The lymphatic system is one way of helping remove um, toxins and excreting. So we have our spleen, lymph nodes, lymph, lymph vessels, the thymus gland, and other components within, within that. All right. So with that, it supports the circulatory system and immune system. The lymph is a, is a thin, straw-colored fluid that carries oxygen, nutrients, and hormones to the cells and waste products of the metabolism away from the cells to be excreted. Lymph vessels form a network throughout the body that serves as an axillary, sorry, um, not axillary, auxiliary to the circulatory system. It relies on muscle contractions and movements of the upper body or the body, so not the upper body, the body to flow, for lymph to flow. And lymph nodes are tiny oval shaped structures that filter lymph, which help through the body of toxins and any other kind of harmful materials. Um, <clears throat> the endocrine system is a complex system um, that helps, um, let me start over. <laughs> Getting late. So the endocrine system is a complex message and control system, which integrates many body functions, which we kind of talked about a little bit before. Uh, it can release hormones directly into the bloodstream. Examples of epinephrine, norepinephrine, or insulin. And each endocrine gland produces one or more hormones. So the brain controls the release of hormones and excretes uh, or excesses or deficiencies and hormones can cause a disease All right so it's very important to make sure that we're paying attention to the different glands that are there so the adrenal gland rec regulates stress response fight or flight the ovaries um, regulate sexual function characteristics reproduction of women and the pancreas regulates glucose metabolism and other functions the parathyroid regulates serum calcium Pituitary gland regulates all other endocrine, endocrine glands. And honestly, with the, the testes on a male regulates sexual function characteristics and reproduction for men. All right, so the urinary system, another important part for us as well, um, controls the discharge of in certain waste materials filtered from the body of the kidneys. So remember the kidneys are a solid organ and in the kidney, it has, we also have the ureters, the bladder and the urethra, which are hollow organs. And we'll kind of go more of that here in a second. Um, and the main function of the urinary system obviously is to control fluid balance in the body, control our pH and filter eliminated waste. So the body has, um, has two kidneys that lie retroperitoneal. So think of your backside more toward the, or the flank or more towards the back. That's called retroperitoneal to the abdominal cavity. 
So kidneys rid the body of toxic waste products and control the balance of water and salt. Right, we have to have kidneys that function appropriately. All right, waste products and water that constantly filtered from the blood to form urine. And the kidneys then concentrate this filtered urine by reabsorbing the water as it passes through a system of specialized tubes. A ureter passes through the kidney to drain the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder then is located immediately behind the pubic symphysis in the pelvic cavity, and the bladder empties to the outside of the body through the urethra. Why is this important? This is very susceptible to infection, especially UTIs, right? Males have a longer ure urethra than females do. That's why females are more susceptible to UTIs than males are. However, keeping this in mind, if they're cathing at home, putting Foley catheters in, that's a line of infection right to the bladder. All right, a bladder of infections can become very common. It also can become very septic as well. Uh, there are also medications out there. I'm sure of all you have heard of water pills like Lasix or furosemide. Uh, you see a lot of patients that have congestive heart failure that are on Lasix. Lasix is a non-potassium sparing loop diuretic. And in the kidney, you have an ascending and descending loop, and it helps stimulate those loops to make more urine, help to excrete fluid from the body. All right. So patients that are on Lasix and take too much of it and dehydrate really quickly, all right, and it can also cause cardiac arrhythmias because it pisses out all the potassium doesn't give a chance to replenish it. That's why it's called non-potassium sparing, right? So you may see patients on Lasix that have different arrhythmias in the heart and or also very dehydrated. All right, so the genital system, we're getting very close to the end here, um, controls the reproductive process by which life is created. The male reproductive system consists of testicles, epididymis, the vasa differentia, prostate gland, seminal vesicles, and the penis, which lies outside the pelvic cavity except for the prostate gland and the seminal vesicles. As you can see in the diagram here. All right, moving forward. The female system I'm just reading up in the comments really quick. All right. So the female system has ovaries, the fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, and vagina. Um, with that being said, um, one of the – if you have a female patient – I'm going to get more of this in abdominal pain. If you have a female patient who is sexually active in childbearing age that has unexplained abdominal pain, most likely it's an ectopic pregnancy. And that ectopic pregnancy is usually found in the most common places of fallopian tube. Kind of keep that kind of stuff in mind when we're doing our assessments. As you can see here. So what you'll see is the fallopian tube is located up here. A lot of times the egg will implant here and start developing, causing significant abdominal pain. All right, getting close to the end, um, the life support chain, all cells in the body require oxygen, nutrients, and removal of waste. Without this, our body cannot function. Um, the circulatory system is the carrier of these supplies and waste. Without good circulars, without a system that can circulate appropriately, we can have deficiencies. By doing so, cells become damaged and then they can die. Cells use oxygen to turn nutrients into chemical energy through metabolism, ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is used to store the energy. Aerobic metabolism uses oxygen. Cells which uh, switch to anaerobic metabolism with oxygen is limited. The lactic acid is very dam damaging waste product. Keep lactic acid in the back of your head, okay? So you're going to see that more when we start talking about crush injuries and how dangerous it is to the system.
Movement of oxygen and waste and nutrients occurs by diffusion. Remember, diffusion is done through a gas, right? Osmosis is a fluid. pH is crucial to diffusion. The normal pH of a body, of our body, is 7.35 to 7.45. We run a little bit alkalotic, all right? Well, that's a normal pH value for, for any, for, for human being. Is 7.35 to 7.45. You may see that pop up on an exam at some point. The body expends a large amount of energy to maintain normal pH. Pathophysiology is a study of functional changes that occur when the body reacts to a disease. Respiratory compromise is the inability for the body to move gas effectively. Hypoxia, right, is low oxygen levels within the system, okay? So low oxygen in the blood, hypoxemia or hypoxia, right? And hypercarbia would be high carbon dioxide levels in the system. So hypoxia being decreased level of oxygen, hypercarbia being elevated carbon dioxide, right? Patients that have respiratory compromise that have hypoxia and hypercarbia need to be fixed. And one of the methods we can utilize for that would be is using a BVM or giving them oxygen to help with that gas exchange. Um, some factors that impair ventilation, obviously a blocked airway, impairment of muscles of breathing, airway uh, is obstructed, like physiologically, like with an asthma attack or COPD or something like that. And there are numerous other factors, like drug overdose, one of the biggest things we're going to see with that would be opiates, uh, trauma to the chest wall, right, like pulmonary contusions or um, tension to a thorax or allergic reactions. Other factors that impair respiration will be in change in atmosphere, high altitudes, or impaired movement of gases across the cell membrane. All right, we have our ventilation perfusion mismatch, which is what they call a VQ ratio. A VQ ratio describes how much gas is being moved effectively through the lungs and how much blood is flowing around the alveoli where the gas exchange or perfusion occurs. A mismatch occurs when one of those two variables are abnormal. And then that's what happens with that happening, then it causes respiratory compromise. The effects of the respiratory compromise in the body. Hold on one second here. All right, I'm back. Um, so oxygen levels throughout the body um, fall and carbon dioxide levels rise. The brain then detects an increase in carbon dioxide, and then in turn, the body increases respiratory rate in an attempt to return the carbon dioxide levels back to normal. So we're going to see that tachypnea, that fast respiration. Um, if increased respiratory, respiration, respiratory does not occur or it is not effective in returning carbon dioxide levels to normal, the blood will then become more acidic, and therefore our pH will start to drop. Blood oxygen levels will also begin to fall, and this will cause the brain to issue further commands to breathe. Remember before that I mentioned our body needs three things to survive. I think I mentioned this to you guys before early in, early in the program, right? You need blood, sugar, oxygen if you lose any of those three the body will die all right so shock shock occurs when organs and tissues do not receive enough oxygen which impaired oxygen delivery causes cellular hypoxia so we have to oxygenate the system Categorize into several types depending on the cause. 
the effects of the shock on the body or the level of oxygen supplied to the tissue fails or falls. Cells then engage in the anaerobic metabolism, causing a higher lactic acid. Severe metabolic acidosis starts kicking in. Now our bicarb levels are going elevated, causing our pH to drop. Our baroreceptors initiate the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Therefore, our heart starts to increase, heart rate increases, and then our interstitial fluid moves into the capillaries. By doing so, once the level of tissue hyperperfusion is reached, we start getting cell damage, then proceeds into a similar managed manner, regardless of the underlying cause of the shock. These patients need fluid, oxygen, and things like that. All right, so impairment of cellular metabolism results in the ability to properly use oxygen and glucose at the cellular level, which then cells create energy through anaerobic metabolism, which then can result in the metabolic acidosis. Um, the brain cells cannot use alternative fuels, and then you start becoming cellular injury, which may become irreversible. When we get into that irreversible shock, at that point in time, the patient will end up dying. Right, so that's why we got to we got to treat shock right away, and we got to recognize it and treat it. We can't wait. All right, let's go to some review questions, and we'll call it a night. Which of the following are found in the retroperitoneal space? Retroperitoneal being located towards the flank in the back. Uh, kidneys. Kidneys, it is. The cartilaginous tip of the sternum is called so that's the lower part of the sternum. Is it the that's no, good job? The xiphoid process. A person with bilateral femur fractures has, break it down, bilateral, all right, the answer is B, good job. Number four, the most prominent landmark of the anterior surface of the neck is, Oh. Seeing some C's, C's, thyroid cartilage, awesome. Good job. There we go. Uh, number five, insulin is produced in the pancreas. The pancreas. There we go. Blank connects muscle to bone. Tendons. Yep, tendons, muscle to bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone. The normal resting heart rate for an adult is? 60 to 100. Perfect. The left atrium of the heart receives blank blood from the blank. All right, A it is. Number nine, the largest part of the brain is? A. A, perfect. And number 10, which of the following statements about the red blood cells is false? D. E. All right, the answer is C. False statement. All right, we turn the recording off.